Let me welcome at this moment uh, our brother Israel from Houston chapter, the president of Houston chapter to open us with a word of prayer. Brother Israel, go ahead. Thank you, Brother Carl. Our Heavenly Father, we have come to you this morning to offer praises and thanksgiving for what you have done in this family, African Christian Fellowship, from local to national. Father, you have been our God all these years. We want to thank you especially for the blessings you've given us in the areas of our marriages, oh Lord. Father, when things are shaking around, you have held us together. When things are leaking everywhere, you have patched us together. We just want to thank you, Lord. We have come again on this program we specifically mapped out for families, oh Lord. I know you've gone ahead of us. We just want to thank you. We lift you up this morning, Lord. Father, we have written down programs, we have ideas, we have speakers, but you are the only one that have ultimate will for us, things that you want us to learn this morning, Lord. So Father, we commit your servants who have worked desperately to make this happen. Father, we look forward for what you have for us today. We ask, Lord, that you touch every family that is here today, both face your family members and friends, everybody that's had logged in, Lord, Father, open up new doors and windows in our marriages to make lives better in our families. We thank you one more time, oh Lord, for our chairman, our president, all the executives in the regional level. We thank you, Father, for everybody that you've been using, even in the mission level. Father, while these people are serving, you are the one that held our family together. And we look forward this morning, Father, for what you have for us. So we thank you, Lord. We, Father, we take authority over the airwaves that everything that will be done will be heard and, and understood this morning. Glory be to your name, Lord. That's much to say, no much to ask, but we know you have the last word. We thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. And those that are trying to log in, Father, quicken their steps so that they can come in. And let this program today be a historic one in the family of ACF for your own glory. All this I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. We are so grateful that all of us are here today. So at this time, we would want to welcome the president of South Region to give us a greetings by Bro Emanuel on a label. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, thank you, Chandi, and thank you, uh, Martin. I just want to welcome each and every one of you for making time out. We do not take your time for granted. We are extremely, extremely grateful that you joined us today in this program, and we are delighted to see, um, and we're, we're delighted and in an expert on what God would do through this program. Um, I just want to welcome um, everyone. We have people joining across, even with outside our chapters. I want to welcome those in the South region, to welcome our visitors and our meets. We have visitors from Canada, those people from Nigeria. I just want to especially welcome you. This is African Christian Fellowship. And this is a family in essence. This family is the bedrock of everything that we do in African Christian Fellowship. And, I'm even more delighted um, about the program we're going to be discussing today, uh, family, um, about legacy, family legacy, true grace. It's just, it's just um, we're building, what we're building, uh, my prayer is would I'll pass each and every one of us. I just, um, as I was thinking about the program, I was led to um, second, second Timothy 1, and I'm reading from the ESV version uh, from verse three, it says, "Guard the." De it actually, the, it's captioned, "Guard the deposit entrusted to you." And I'll read from verse three. It says, "I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day, as I remember your tears. I long to see you, that I may be filled with you." Verse five. That's where the whole what I'm trying to say. Is, is I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, 
glories and your mother Eunice and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. This in itself is just legacy. This is Paul speaking to um, Timothy. Um, it's my prayer that whenever we leave this world we would leave a legacy that would outpass, that will speak for us in the mighty name of Jesus. And I would use this opportunity to um, welcome the chairman so that the chairman too um, can say something. Um, Brother Felix Ada, I welcome you just to greet the brethren. And again, I would say um, uh, while the program is going on, enjoy yourself, stay muted. Please continue to use the chat for questions. We have um, over 170, actually 180, <laughs> I take that back, 180 registrants. So for all this meeting to run efficiently, we encourage brethren to please take up, as in take advantage of the um, chatting forum. Questions will be answered from there. The moderators are, in are taking note of everything that is in the chat. Uh, I would say sit back, relax, and enjoy the program till the end. We have a whole lot of things packed in this program for you. At this moment, I call on the chairman to say a few things. Thank you, brethren. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, a man of honor. I just want to congratulate uh, Brother Monty and the Kennedy, uh, Sister Kennedy. This is their first uh, host for us, and God bless you. I know this is not on my, I know on the program. Thank you, my president, for inviting me, but I just want to be brief. As uh, now you all know, I just wanted to say one thing this is a family. You can look at family at different levels, within your immediate family, your extended family, African Christian Fellowship family members, as a Bini man, a Do man, a Do family, as a Nigeria, a Nigeria family, as an African, African family, as an American, American family, my place of work, a family. But one thing pray through all this, your behavior, your character, your patience, your understanding, your grace, so I want to encourage every one of us to exemplify these great characters of God. The initial intent is really not to make money, it's not to be rich, but first show goodness, have patience. Let your wife trust you, let your husband trust you, let your children trust you, let the people you deal with trust you. Uh, you know, show grace at the end, Everything else will follow. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Every other thing will be added unto you. So I encourage you that just show love, show patience, forgive, bring people together, be having a heart of service to serve one another. So at the end, that's it. I was telling my wife this morning, I'll be doing a second, a few seconds. I told her, I said, thank you, honey, for taking this life journey with me. You know, I just said that before she started here. I mean, truly, she is, it has been a life journey, uh, you know, from different parents we came together and all. And this journey will come to our end. So what you leave behind is the grace of God, the love you show. That is the one that will be remembered, not the word you have. God bless you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, at this time, I want to welcome to the stage our beloved brother who will be leading us in worship and praise. Uh, this brother is one of us. In fact, if I mention his name, you all will know him. He is the son of our beloved Reverend Emetase. So it is my pleasure at this time to welcome brother Udo that's it. Uh, this time is yours. Uh, lead us through the uh, throne of grace. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, ACA family. And um, uh, you know, it's a privilege to, to be here in the presence of God. And um, we just want to welcome him this morning. Um, I indulge you, you know, wherever you are, just, you know, tune in and, uh, you know, let's worship God. Holy Spirit, 
Thou art welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Thou art welcome in this place, omnipotent Father of mercy and grace. Thou art I've, I've been on mute the whole time. Hallelujah. 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 Father, yes, you are worthy of our praise, and to you our hearts we raise. You 
are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome, God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father, Abba Father. You are worthy of our praise, and to you our hearts we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are worthy of our praise, and to you our hearts we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. to you, Brother Emmanuel. Um, th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Uto. Uh, Brother Emma, do you have anything to say? No, oh, I was just calling on your attention to pick up. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, honey, go ahead. All right. So at this time, we are going to have our keynote speaker. That will be... Um, taking us to the next session. And that is no other person than Professor Nefan Umana. So Mr. Nefan Umana was born in Nigeria after completing his high school and working six years in the bank. He migrated to the United States of America in 1978. He studied industrial engineering and graduated with a bachelor's of science degree. He went on to study mathematics and graduated with a master's of science degree in 1990. 
and he also graduated in 1996 with master's of arts degree in biblical studies from Atlanta School of Biblical Studies in Decatur, Georgia. And then from 1985 to 1986, he was a pre-engineering instructor in Dutch City Community College in Kansas City. And also from 1987 to 1992, he worked for Westin House Groundwater Recovery, Doravia, Georgia in manufacturing de department. And from September um, 1992 until he retired, he was an associate professor of mathematics. On, 19, on August 1st, 2018, he taught mathematics in the DeKalb College, which finally became Georgia Perimeter College and then ended up to become College of Georgia State University at this time. He was appointed department chair of the Department of Mathematics, Computer Science and Engineering in, that, in this college from 2007 to 2009. And now he also was a president in African Christian Fellowship Atlanta from 1996 to 1999. And he also got ordained as a minister of gospel in 2012 by Word of Faith Ministry Incorporated in Georgia. So now let's welcome, um, as he comes to speak to us today about family legacy from a Christian perspective, Professor Iman. Umana. Professor Reverend Umana. <laughs> Welcome, Uncle. The stage is yours. I am going to share your screen right away. Okay. Praise the Lord, brethren. Uh, God bless you. Such an introduction. Well, that's not the point. We are here not to listen to man. We are here to talk about legacy through grace. Uh, my uh, designated topic is a family legacy from a Christian perspective. But the overall uh, theme, legacy through grace, there was a, or there is a scripture that uh, is attached to that, and that should you should see on the uh, flyer that you received. Um, when I got this topic, I, I thought about it, and how do I talk about this legacy from a Christian perspective? What do I say? How can I present this as I prayed? I then linked it back to the uh, uh, verse of scripture that is on the flyer that uh, was sent to everybody. But before I begin, I wanna thank Martin, the executive for opportunity to ask me to speak. When I look at the, the faces and the different people, on this screen, man, I said, who am I that they asked me to speak? But I, I, I don't take these things lightly. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to the next screen. Advance to the next screen. Next slide, I mean. Ron Martin? Yeah, just bear with us, the screen okay. just, yeah. You can just, we'll, we'll get it right quick. Oh, okay. Uh, the objective this morning, uh, I want to, we want to look at, uh, oh, before, look at my wife. I'm sorry, I almost got in trouble. Uh, my <laughs> wife uh, in Omana, Atlanta, calls her uh, one your chair. So if you want to call her, that, that's fine, you are allowed. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this morning, the uh, objectives, what is legacy? What is grace? Reasons for legacy through grace. Forms of legacy. How does legacy come about? Challenges. A legacy through the son of promise. Abraham, family tree, duration of legacy and conclusion. I'm not sure, based on the time I have, I'm gonna try the best I can. Martin, please. When it's time, you know me with time. When it is time, just let me know so I stop. It doesn't matter where far I go. This slide would be provided to anybody who wants. When you look at the Webster Dictionary, it's got a dip. Okay, a definition of a, a legacy, uh, different le definition. So the one highlighted is the one that really goes along with what we're talking about today. Legacy is something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. 
So we're gonna deal with that, uh, move on, next slide. Next slide. Okay, what is grace? Again, um, the dictionary has, no, go back. What is grace? The dictionary has a different <clears throat> definition for grace, but the one that aligns with what we're talking about is grace as given by Webster, unmerited divine assistance given to humans for the regeneration or sanctification. Okay, move on, next slide. Reasons for legacy, as I said, this scripture here is the one that uh, uh, helped me build the thing that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, in Genesis 18 verse 19, God said, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Do you see that is legacy, God knew Abraham. Yeah, I'm asking the question, you could search this out. When did God know Abraham? You know, Abraham was born in uh, uh, all of the Chaldeans. Look at Genesis 11, 26 through 29, we're not, couldn't have time to read that. He was a worshiper of idols as his uh, father, Terah. You, you could confirm that from Joshua 24 too. God knew Abraham before he was formed in his mother's womb. That's the same thing God said to Jeremiah, before you were formed, I knew you. How does that apply to us? God knows us, God knows us and what we will turn out to be. What is God going to say about us? as he said in Genesis 18, 19 about Abraham. So that is the legacy that we wanna talk about. Next slide. Forms of legacy. Uh, you can have legacy of obedience and faith as seen with Abraham, legacy of love for God as seen in David, legacy of wisdom as in case of Solomon, legacy of sin, and oppression, many Old Testament kings and leaders of today are turned. They operate in that kind of legacy. I know God, that would not be a portion in Jesus' name. What kind of legacy are we living? Are we intentional about leaving a legacy? Do we make our intentions known to our family? Next slide. How does legacy come about? Do you just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm gonna leave a legacy. How does it come about? In this case study that we're looking about, talking about today, I'm talking about uh, Abraham. I don't see any better person. Thank God for uh, what our president of South region read about uh, Timothy that Paul talked about, amazing. But when you come to look at Abraham, he's a father of faith. How did God come to say he's gonna be the one that does all those things that we read? When did the legacy of Abraham begin? You know, God, this man was a, a worshiper of idols. If you look at that Joshua 24 too, with his father, how did it happen that of all the people God went to him? Of course, we know God says, I read, I know him and all the things that he would do, things in righteousness, faith and all that. In Genesis 12, 4, Abraham left and God said to him, leave. And Abraham left as the Lord told him. And Lord went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. God came to this man and said, leave. Every one of us here on this line. If you are born again, you have the same opportunity as God gave to Abraham. He said, come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly tells us by faith that uh, we receive God by faith. So if you look at uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So when God spoke to you, you heard the gospel and he gave you the grace, the faith, everything, this, you, you, you and I had nothing in us. 
that could have made it possible for us to respond to God. But God put that in us and we responded to him. So you see, you have the same footing with Abraham. There's no indication that Abraham called on God. God came to him and that was grace. The same grace that God extended and continues to extend to us today, he did that to Abraham. We are saved by grace through faith. Sorry, my typo right there, through faith. So faith and grace, grace that God gave to us, faith that God uh, supplied to us. Abraham received a sevenfold promise from God. Look at that scripture. This legacy began when God made him the sevenfold promise or when he act what he left. God spoke to him in obedience and in faith he left. God promised him a son and also to make him a father of a great nation, Genesis 15, one to five. Abraham believed and God declared him righteous because of his faith. The belief that we have begins to establish the legacy. This is how the legacy came about. God came and spoke to him. He believed God. God said, leave. He left, obeyed God. And he believed God. And you're going to see many, many difficult circumstances in his life. He believed God. And God walked that out. And his legacy began. You and I have the same kind of path today. God came to us, saved us. And he has put us on a path to do something for him. Are we on track? God entered into blood covenant with Abraham, Genesis 7 through uh, 7 verse 11. So when you look at what God did, covenant has been established between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so Abraham got the same thing, or we got the same thing that Abraham got. It may not be exactly in the same form but we have a covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to be born again. Now in this uh, march towards a uh, legacy, there are gonna be challenges. There are gonna be challenges. Faith in God is gonna help us. Look at the challenges that Abraham had to deal with. His wife, Sarah, a son has been promised and the son didn't happen in her schedule. And the wife, being barren at the time, she cut a deal with her husband to have a son through Hagar, who was her maid. The deal worked, and Ishmael was born. I know many people badmouth Abraham. You are a man of God, a man of faith. I, I would dare any man on this line who they would tell me that your wife has never had an influence on you since you were married. I wouldn't say that. Almost 45 years, my wife has influence on me. So I don't know how I would have responded if EU came to me and said, look at this uh, uh, Hagar. We don't have a child. Why don't you? Abraham may stop right here. But I'm not going to judge him because you, as you would see, God says something about him even before uh, this time. So who am I to judge him today looking backwards? The deal worked. Ishmael was not going to, uh, Ishmael was born and that was not the son of promise. God said to Abraham, the one that's going to come from your loin is going to be the one that I'm going to use to do the things that I'm going to do. Now, Ishmael was not going to be the one because God had told Abraham that a son born to him by Sarai would be the one he would establish covenant with. If you see Genesis 17, 17 to 19. That was established. God said that. And now look at the challenge. This boy is now here. And Sarah was really upset. I'm, I'm not going into all the details. When you read these scriptures, you will see that, or you already know this story. Sarah was upset because when uh, this Hagar had uh, this boy, you know, 
and she became like, oh yeah, I have a child now. What, what can you say? You don't have a child. And that ticked uh, Sarah off. Sarah was upset and demanded that Hagar and her son Ishmael be sent away. Because uh, this is not uh, gonna be the son that's gonna inherit uh, the promise that God has made. Abraham was frustrated, but God told him to listen to his wife. So now God had to intervene because Sarai, she's the one who brought this challenge to the husband, but now she's the one that asking uh, Hagar to leave and her son. And that would not make any man happy. Abraham was not happy. But God came and said to Abraham, listen to your wife, let this woman go. There would be, a, there would be challenges to our faith and obedience. The path forward is to keep trusting God. When you are on this uh, path of living a legacy, you're gonna have challenges. The challenges may come from your wife, may come from your children, may come from your husband, may come from wherever, but there would be challenges. But what are we gonna do? We have to make up our mind to keep going, keep trusting God, keep, keep having faith in God. Uh, the, the, the thing you wanna do, you wanna endeavor also, as you would see, a child is gonna come as God had ordained for that child to come. And from that child, things are gonna happen that God had ordained to happen. So you would see one of the bullet points there before this slide, I said, endeavor, endeavor to make sure, and it's gonna be a challenge that your children, endeavor to see that your children marry believers in Christ. Because if you know that Abraham, when they were looking for a, a wife for, this uh, son of promise, Isaac, he said, go to my people. Not necessarily, you know, we don't, we, today we think if we go to Korokweya, which is where I'm going, coming from, and get a wife from there, that's going to be the one. That's, that's not what is. Go to my people. My people believe in God. So therefore, go to the community of believers to find a child, a, a, a son or daughter for your a wife or your son, or a, 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 um, a son for your daughter. Make sure that's what you do. And that could become a challenge because your son may see a woman with beautiful legs and all those uh, accolades and those kind of thing and say, this is the one. And that woman may not be a believer. And we're seeing that happen in our times. So, that can be a challenge. So you have to begin to pray. Next slide. So now we see Isaac is in the picture now. When Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and changed his name to Abraham. God confirmed his promise of seed and land to him. Again, Genesis 17, 1 to 8. God established covenant of circumcision with Abraham. Uh, Genesis 17, 10 to 13. God told Abraham to start calling his wife Sarai, Sarah, not Sarai, any longer, and promised to give him a son by Sarah. Genesis 17, 15 to 16. When Abraham was 100 years old, Isaac was born. Genesis 21, 1 to 8. God ordered Abraham to sacrifice Isaac at, on Mount Moriah, and he obeyed God. A man waited a hundred years. If you look at uh, Romans chapter four, it talks about how Abraham did not stagger because of unbelief. But I just told you Abraham and his wife brought in a son from a different route. That was not how God planned it. But by faith, deep down in Abraham's uh, heart, he continued to believe God. And when he was 100 years old, this son was born. You begin to think about what 100 would look like. I don't, uh, a lot of us here, we are going that direction. 
and, and you could see what he was with Abraham. Even when uh, angels came and told uh, uh, Sarah that uh, you are going to uh, have a child, Sarah laughed. A angel said, why are you laughing? Said, she said, I did not laugh. Angel said, you were laughing. She said, uh, the angel just left that alone. But that lie there did not stop God doing what he had promised to do. So therefore, when God has led you to have a legacy, he would do everything to make sure that happens. Even now, when this child is born, God did what? Tasted a Abraham. You and I are gonna have this as we try to establish a legacy from a Christian perspective. Many people would not, may not stand with us based on our obedience. See here, God or that Abraham. I'm not saying God is going to ask you to sacrifice your son. That's not going to happen anymore. Jesus already has been sacrificed, done with. That's it. But there are other difficult things that God may ask you and I to do as a test in the process of legacy from a Christian perspective. God ordered Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah and he obeyed God. But the amazing thing here is that every time I read this scripture, I didn't see or hear anybody even preach about where was Sarah? Was Sarah part of the decision or was it the cultural norm at the time is that is the man that makes the decision? Do you think your wife would stand for you to take your, your son and her son to go to sacrifice? This can pose a real challenge as you are in the process of fulfilling the legacy that God has for you. God intervened and ordered him to kill a ram instead of Isaac for the sacrifice. In whatever God puts in your way, as you're establishing legacy, he will intervene to make sure by his grace that it is done. The question is, why Isaac, not Ishmael? Isaac is the son of promise. God's grace again, God knows best. Isaac, Ishmael was the firstborn, why not him? In many of our cultures, you know the firstborn is the one that's supposed to be the one everything emanates from, but not in this case, because God knows best. As things evolve in your family, as you begin to walk towards legacy, God knows best. You may not know all the route and detail that he's going to take you, but he will take you. When you look at uh, the legacy of uh, Abraham, do you know when Stephen, while he, before he became a stone in Acts of the Apostle, chapter 7, verse 8, Stephen only mentioned Abraham having Isaac and Isaac having Jacob and Jacob becoming the father of the 12 patriarchs. Do you see that? He didn't say anything about Ishmael. Didn't say anything about any other person because this is the lineage, the line that produced what God had already said about Abraham. Next slide. I don't know whether you could see there very clearly. I adapted this from conformingtojesus.com, Abraham's family. If you look at that, Terah and the top, Abraham and all that, the arrows. If you come to look carefully, you pay attention to where uh, Isaac is, Isaac from Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob, you see the wife, Leah. Uh, Jacob was tricked, and he married, uh, uh, he, married uh, uh, he wanted to marry Rachel, but uh, Laban tricked him, and he went and slept with uh, the older daughter, Leah, after spending seven years. So he had to spend another seven years to get Rachel. 
And of course, Rachel didn't have children immediately. Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, God, Asher, Isaac, Zebulun. Now, when you add all of that from the, I know it's not very clear there, but when you look at that, you see that's where the 12 tribe came from. The left-hand side of that genealogy or family line of Abraham, the left-hand side, you don't hear much about. Sometimes what you hear is trouble they caused. So when you are establishing staying in obedience and faith and for what God has promised to do, because you and I are Christian believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the tastings and the trials and the problems and difficulties that you go through, because the devil knows what God is gonna do with your family. Whatever he's throwing out there, look at this man. Can you imagine your son has seen the person she wants to marry is a Christian and all that. And the mother, uh, <laughs> the father brought another person said, no, in, in this culture, you can't come and marry the second daughter when the first one is still hanging around. I made you made you unknowingly go and impregnate the older daughter and things just good from that direction. But God, even in his grace, all of those children from Leah became the patriarch. See how that God works all those things through Jacob. So God is able to take even something that is broken up and make it work to still bring about his purpose. Next slide. Okay, we talk about duration of legacy. The legacy of Abraham is forever. See, we still talk about Abraham. Galatia, talk, I'm, I don't know any way in New Testament somewhere we talk about that. Abraham was a man of faith and obedience. Had an amazing impact on his children, grand and great grandchildren. The New Testament speaks about his faith, Romans 4, Galatians 3, 6 to 9, Hebrews 11, 18, just to mention a few. So the New Testament talks about, when you read about Abraham in the New Testament, you may ask, is that the same Abraham that we read about in the Old Testament who was a liar, told a lie about uh, his wife, that his wife was his sister. Maybe she was a half sister, but a half lie is still lie. So you see duration of legacy as God is involved. You and I want to establish a duration where if somebody sees my son somewhere, said, whose son are you, a nephew or manner? I hope I have a character that somebody would say, hmm. If they see him do something that is different, it's like, hmm, I'm not sure. But if we don't establish a legacy as God gives us the grace to do, then things may be quite questionable. See, legacy of David is forever. David was a man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? No. Are we perfect? No. The legacy of wicked rulers can go on for generations until God intervenes. We've seen wicked rulers, many of us here from Africa. We've seen people come and do wickedness, go and leave their children, come and uh, family members, wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. But until God intervenes, that can go forever. Financial legacy could end with hers who squander the wealth. I know even in your where we come from, we knew people who were wealthy, wealthy, very wealthy. The moment they died, their sons uh, pick up, before you know it, every fight, and that ended. Even in this country, we, have, we can have a legacy of righteousness which we know is gonna go on forever because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, next slide. Martin, how am I doing with time? Abraham. I don't know whether anybody is born that way. And I can support that because uh, uh, the Bible says, for all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. So, so nobody's born righteous, not one. If you were born into a, a Christian family, bless you, but you're not born righteous. You're just born into a family that know God. You have to know God by yourself. Abraham chose to believe and obey God. You and I can do the same. We can choose to believe God. We can choose to have faith in God. When we struggle, God is still there to, to give us his grace for us to be successful. Abraham was not perfect. He yielded to pray of Sarai in an attempt to bring about God's promise in that own way. He told lies. We are not perfect either. The grace of God prevailed for Abraham and will for us also. As we trust, as from perspective, we can take this rule of Abraham faith, knowing that absolutely there's nothing in you and I that can make it happen unless God is with us. Even the very faith that we think we have, if God doesn't give us that measure of faith, then we're not going to get anywhere. When it looked impossible, can you imagine marry this woman you like, you love? It looked impossible. The child is promised as it's not coming. And when you are tempted to do things your way, when I'm tempted to do things my way, but Abraham, even when what they did kind of boom around the way it did, he continued to obey and trust God. We can learn from him. You and I can learn from Abraham. You know, we fall down, we mess up, we wake up and say, I'm going to continue to trust God, even though it looks so difficult. When Sunny would sit there and a wife, you have some yard that you and your child, and you just sit there and take it. But God spoke to him. I, I wouldn't even believe that it was God. I would think maybe I ate too much pizza. But God spoke to him and said, No, listen to your wife. How many of us listen to our wife? As I'm concluding, that woman that's with you, God put her there to help you so that as a Christian, a legacy would be established from that perspective. Abraham wasn't happy, but he submitted and obeyed his wife. We can submit to God when God asks us to do something. When God said, in Ephraim, listen to you know, listen to your EU. No matter what I think, God helped me to do that. When God told him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to him, he obeyed. God may ask us to offer something that is very dear to us. Will you and I obey as we're trying to establish legacy from a Christian perspective? Legacy didn't happen by fire and deep brimstone. Abraham lived a life. Abraham continued to walk, walk the talk, continued to obey, continued to have faith in God. And God made it happen. Even though he stumbled here and there, God made it happen. As believers, the Holy Spirit is with us. And God is faithful as he leads us, as he directs us. Whatever the legacy is that God wants you to establish from a Christian perspective, 
uh, whatever it is, here we see legacy of righteousness based on what God uh, said to him from that scripture that we read from uh, Genesis chapter 18. Let me read that scripture again. Genesis, if I can find it quickly, <clears throat> it says, uh, Genesis 18, 19, God said, for I have known him, as I've known Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken of him, that he would become a father of nations. May God bless you as you, whatever legacy God is leading you to establish from a Christian perspective, know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And God is able to guide you to do it. Thank you. God bless you. I don't know, do I, uh, did I exceed my time, Martin? You actually, you know, lend us some time and we really appreciate it. You, you did well with the time. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I believe that we've been blessed by this word of encouragement. And, you know, there's a challenge here. Uh, we've been challenged. We've been encouraged. And one of the things that I'm picking up today uh, that, you know, I've not really looked at it from this angle. You mentioned something that Abraham had a blood covenant and Jesus also became our covenant you know to god whereby we are able to have a very tangible relationship with god yes. in conclusion as we move to the next section i just want you to think about this scripture god testified about abraham yes and the bible says in the book of proverbs chapter 22 verse 1 a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches Yes. I just want you to, you know, know that, you know, the legacy is already on. It's not about are you going to leave a legacy? Definitely there's going to be a legacy. What type of legacy? Mm -hmm. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rust. God bless you all. We'll move to the next section uh, at this time. Uh, bef before that, I will request. Um, a prayer for us to pray that God will give us the grace. Uncle, can you just go ahead and pray, uh, you know, with the heart that you've received this message, that God will give us grace to do this? Because in all, we said we can only do this through the grace of God. Father, we thank you for the grace you've given to us. There may be many among us that as they think legacy, they look at their marriages, Things are not going the direction it should go. They look at their children. Some are not born again. Some are going in a different direction. They look at so many things surrounding them. Abraham had those challenges, but God came through for him. So Lord, I thank you because you are going to come through for us. Your word says, if you did not spare giving us your son, you will not, oh God, keep away all the good things that you have planned for us. So Lord, by grace, by grace and your mercies, whatever the legacy is that you have ordained to happen in our lives, may that be so in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. So we're going to move to the next session. And this session is Building Generational Wealth Through Grace. And um, we'll be introducing our brother, Nana Ampe Dakar. He's originally from Ghana and he's married with kids. And he has his, he got his first degree in economics, pursued C ACCA in the UK equivalent of a CPA. And he's also a member of the Chartered Economics USA. He graduated in data science, MIT. Awesome. And he has a career in investment banking for 10 years. Now he's working with the big four Deloitte at New York City, USA. And also he's a senior consultant, financial advisory and risk information technology, cloud computing and ML. So let's welcome our brother, brother Nana Ampem 
that call to speak to us on building generational wealth through grace. And he will be focusing on personal financing, budgeting, and investment. Thank you. And just to let us know, there will be a time for question. So just um, begin to, as he goes on to speak to us, I just want you to help us with time to type in your questions in the chat room. We'll definitely pull it up later on. Thank you. Brother Nan, over to you. Um, thank you, my brother. Um, um, good morning to you all. And uh, yeah. Good morning to you all. It's a privilege and honor to be called here to share my knowledge, to share, to share my knowledge and expertise with you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, organizers, and thank you, UCF members. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be called upon and elucidate these areas of my expertise. Um, the earlier speaker did a wonderful job actually telling us about the spiritual part and what we ought to do as Christians. Um, my topics has part of grace. In my in going forward, I will inculcate that part of the spirituality alongside, but I'll focus on the education on finance, investment, and buying. Thank you so much. So let me start by sharing my screen with you. Okay. So we see a region. Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying that finance has been a subject matter where people think, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, so I don't need to know finance. But we all remember that we work and make some money or we make money work for us. So it is imperative that every one of us will have an understanding of finance, investment, and opportunities thereof, especially in the United States. Okay. So what do I say this? So it brings me to the point of financial literacy and financial education. It is incumbent on us and all of us as a, as a sense of responsibility to our families and our kids to educate ourselves and educate them in finance. Because but what does it take to work and get the money and you're able to manage it? That is waste. And so I always say it's not about how much you make, but how much you're able to save. It brings me to the point of financial foundation. Financial foundation is very important in every one of us, our lives. Now there are a ton of resources available to your, at your disposal where you can make it a point that every year I will try to read one financial education material, you know, to augment my understanding in finance. And so if you get these foundations, it means that um, the topic where we are concentrated on creating, creating, um, um, how, do you, how do you put it? Um, creating, building generational wealth through grace is brought to bear because we need to, first of all, have the foundation, you know, so all what I'm saying that many households should embrace financial education, we should embrace, you know, building a strong foundational blocks to sustain our wealth. Now, what about debt management? We'll talk deep about these things in, in my earlier in my presentation. We also talk about time. We also talk about rate of return. And we always talk about uh, inflation. Inflation is a canker and before in the United States, you might think that, oh, we don't have high inflation rates and all that, but looking at our current dispensation, inflation rate is about 7.5 now in the US. This is the highest in, in well, 42 years. And so taking financial decisions, you should be able to appreciate the inflationary environment that we find ourselves. So you can actually position yourself well. We talk about taxes. 
and we'll talk about building world slowly. And with that, as believers, I give you Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11, and I give you something on inheritance, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Now, the four financial foundation layers. First of all, we talk about protection, we talk about debt management, we talk about emergency fund, talk about investment. I have done this in blogs because what do I mean by pro protection? Protecting your financial vehicle or protecting your financial situations, where I call in the US here, we have health insurance. We have all these um, flexible insurance plans that we can help to first of all protect ourselves. So in case we find ourselves sick, you don't have to dump into your emergency fund or you don't have to dump into your, your credit card to actually seek refuge. It is important to protect and have that foundation that, okay, I'm covered insurance, I'm covered this, I'm covered that, okay. Then we'll talk about debt management. This is very core to your financial success. It's very important. And we talk about emergency fund and we talk about investment. And so I have done this in layers because listen, if you don't manage your debt well, you can't even have some as emergency fund. And if you don't have the emergency fund vis-a-vis -vis your savings, you can't use that savings to invest. And so it's a trigger down effect going forward. Understand how money works. You know, um, there's a wealth formula. First of all, I brought this. This concept or goal is developed by a World Financial Group for illustrative purposes. Excuse me. Um, in no way does this statement offer guaranteed or otherwise implied financial um, role for the world as a result of joining YFE or something like that. The term wealth is a subjective and must, it's subjective and must be and must be defined in an individual basis. World Financial Group and its independent associates do not offer tax or, this is just a disclaimer or some sort. So now we'll talk about world and world I consider as the, uh, the world formula. If you look at the ingredients of the world formula, money is a factor, time is a factor, Rate of return is a factor. Inflation is a factor. Taxes is a factor. Okay. So let's do the money talk. Then I look at ways of increasing household disposable income. Okay, good. I, I like this area because many a times people think that, oh, I am making this and I, 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 I'm living hand to mouth and all that, but it's all because of lack of planning and lack of taking those financial decisions. Because in the economy, we have two ways of maximizing profit. It's either you are maximizing your revenue, holding um, expenses, expenditure constant, or it's either you are minimizing your cost, i.e. you are minimizing your expenses, okay? Why do I say this? Now, you have some terms at, at, that you have control of. You are working and they are paying you 2,000 bucks in a month. Increments of this salary is dependent on your performance and independent on your employee. Those kind of controls are within the realms and the limits of your employee, okay? What do you have that you can control? What? We call something estrogenous variable and those that are control variables. What can I control of myself? Can I control my expenses? Yes, you can control your expenses. So it's important for every household to look at your leakages. What happens is that if you we, we, we will test certain expenditure items which will fall into our budget and when we get there, okay? So typical household will have utilities, will have mortgage or rent, will have maybe car payments and all that. But listen, there is something within our control. What is in your control? 
this is what are, is variable. Okay, so let me use a case in point. There was a case where my wife we were paying like, uh, it was about almost 200 bucks for our phones and for, for uh, the, the data and all that. So and I was like, no, this is getting too much. I, use, I need to think twice and use my knowledge. So I did some research. We, we used to be with Verizon, right? So when I did my research, I realized that Spectrum had an offer, very cheap offer. But Spectrum rides on Verizon um, uh, towers. So it means that the quality of calls that you receive from Spectrum, uh, you receive from Verizon, even when you are paying the 200 bucks, you can receive a cheaper amount from Spectrum and join that same service. And you probably amend your, your, your bandwidth and all that. Most people have unlimited on their phones, unlimited data, unlimited this, unlimited. But ask yourself, how many times do we make these calls? And the point that now, the current dispensation is such that we are even working from home. And so you are not even using the, the data of the telcos of, of, these, of these agents. They are just, you are just, we are just throwing money away. These are called our leakages. Listen, when I was paying 200, now I want to spread around, you know what? I'm working from home, my wife, is, my wife is working from home. I want to do some, some I want to look at your plan and fix a good, a good uh, that fits our family and our needs. We have Wi-Fi at home. Why do I have to get unlimited my phone? Me and my wife, we pay 28 bucks for two gig of data. The two gig of data is only activated when we move out from the house. We work from home. Now, compare 200 bucks against 28 bucks. You know the difference? Over 150, over 170 bucks. That is savings right there in a month. Multiply this in a year. At least that is about what? If you must buy 10 months, it's about what? 1,500. That is 1,500 right there. These are leakages. Here too, we we're paying to Verizon and enjoying nothing from them. 1,500 times 10 years, all things being equal. That is what? $15,000. And you and I know what $15,000 is worth even here by and back home. And so if you think in this perspective, you actually understand that we need to look at our leakages. What again are our leakages? A typical household of four or three can say that, okay, without any budget, or even with the budget, they can still throw food away. Should we throw food away? Back home, we don't even throw food away. How much more here? When all these things takes a lot of dollar amounts. So look at your, your groceries. Because see, mind you, there are a lot of things in your fridge that you have not even exhausted it. But every day, we go on to the grocery shops and we increase the quantum. So why not having a plan, looking at what as a household, we have monitored how much we need. Instead of doing 200 bus groceries, we will do 100 bus groceries and it still sustain us. So it all depends on your budgeting and it all depends on your plan. So it is important that every household consider the leakages we have. We have leakages. Now, let me talk about the other side of maximizing your revenue. Look at this. Okay, now you, have, you, you are an expert in something, right? You ask yourself, how can I monetize this passion I have? How can I increase my, my income? to sustain the wealth that we are going to talk about. Now, a lot of people are professionals on this platform and you have enormous expertise. There are platforms like Udemy and a lot of numerous platforms where you can have a data course and data course selling an average of maybe $15 per person. And on these platforms are millions of people. If you are a doctor and you decide to take an, a specific area of specialty, concentrate on it, 
and make a course. You don't need to make the course yourself. You need to provide a content. Listen, there are a lot of platforms like Upwork Forever where people are professionally trained themselves in, in creating courses. All you ought to do is to create a course, put it on this platform and sleep. These are money generating vehicles and I call them money making machines. And this is a gateway in building wealth and generating wealth for your even grandkids to come. Because let's you've created this course and it's on this platform, it will be there for years. The age of internet has a lot of opportunities and we cannot go without utilizing and maximizing this expertise. When I look at the registrant fee of ACF members, I could see that a lot of us here are mature old people with different backgrounds. Listen, even if you don't have an expertise that you think, oh, how am I going to solve this to people? You, you might never know. Somebody just want to come to me and learn how to prepare shit up. It's a call, you can do it and put it on YouTube. There are multiple platforms, put it there and just, you don't need to show your face when you are creating these courses. All what you have to do is the content and your voice back in it. And so there are a lot of numerous ways to create some of these words. So I say small changes, but big impact. Big, big, big impact in the sense that we are looking at the compounding interest of all the little, little money you are saving and the little, little revenue you are making on the side. You know, so it is important to consider um, maximizing your income in certain ways that you, you think it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not attainable, but it is actually just that you've not tried it. And I believe that there are a lot of new, a lot of information on the internet that we have to take advantage of. If you want to learn how to create a course, you just Google, you have subject matter experts on creating courses. You Google and you can have podcasts in helping you to create courses. So if you know, oh, like, I don't have time to create course, okay, provide the content, give it to a, co a content creator, a course creator to create a course under your name, you pretend it, you put it there and it's making generational money for you. Okay, let me come to inflation. Inflation is a canker that we will, will have to, you know, strategize and structure our financial vehicle around. You know, so what is inflation? Inflation is just the rise in the prices of goods, the general rise in the price of goods and services over time. And so, so when price increase, your purchasing power decreases. That is when inflation is triggered. Um, suppose if, if, for example, the inflation rate is 7.5, your today, the $100 today will only be worth 92.550 in next year. That is what inflation does. So inflation eats into your money. And you ask yourself, how can you, um, how can you um, um, give yourself some cushion on inflation? It based on the kind of financial decisions we take. And then acknowledging that inflation is rare. So if you go and put your money in the bank, thinking that um, you are saving the money, the money is not worth what it's supposed to because inflation has eaten it all. There was a case in point in Zimbabwe where there was a, um, a, a skyrocketing inflation, where if you are going to buy a bread, you need to pack lots of loose and sums of money to do that. We are fortunate in the United States, we don't have that here, but the point is that it is something that you have to be aware of. We never knew that inflation will rise to this point. If you look at the 7.5, it's on the highest of over the past 42 years. Now, inflation is a major factor to consider when you build your financial future. For instance, if you put money in an account of zero rate of return, its value, its value will certainly decline in the long run. What it means that the purchasing power of, of your money will, will depreciate up, uh, you, you know, at, at a fast pace because your inflation rate is very high. So in building this generational wealth and the vehicle, you need to consider inflation. So let me talk about taxes. I'll be. Benjamin Franklin is an inventor, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a politician. America is it? Nothing is certain in this world except for death and taxes. What this tells us is that taxes are inevitable. You cannot do away with taxes. And so as a family, as a household, as an individual, 
You need to plan around taxes. You know, tax. You, America is said that they've created the tax system and tax codes to benefit people. But the point is that if you don't have that know-how, if you don't consult, if you don't get the knowledge and an information where you can be, you can you can be comfortable around these taxes. You may think that they are there to they are not, they are there not to ignore your benefit. There are a lot of tax codes that can be beneficial. So taxes have a big impact on your money. Any savings and investment strategy must consider the tax impact on it. What is your current tax rate? What will the tax rate be in the future? And will taxes rise or fall? These are concerns and these are things you need to consider in building your wealth. Capital gains. Almost everything you own or use for personal investment purposes is a capital asset, like home, like stocks, bonds. So when you sell assets, the difference between the amounts you sold it for and your basis, which is usually what you paid for it, is a capital gain or a capital loss. Capital gains on assets held for less than one year are short term and usually taxed at an ordinary income tax rate. Capital gains on assets held longer than a year are qualified for long term capital gains. Treatment and taxes at a lower rate. I won't talk much about this too much. Um, here I'm looking at paying tax now and paying tax later, deferring taxes. There are a lot of various with, with if you are a salaried person where you can increase your 401k, which is a pre-tax, you know. And so in the what it means is that in the short term, you are not paying too much tax. But one day when you're taking your 401k, you have to pay your taxes. But the point is that you have to consider the two alternatives and weigh which one is likely to be beneficial and to sustain my, my wealth creation. Now, let me talk about debt management. Debt management is very crucial in America. The average household in America has a lot of debts in credit card. You know, almost half of the people in America cannot have 500 bucks in their account. And this is very serious. It all boils down to managing your debt. How do you manage your debt? It is important to always take advantage of the system. I, I wouldn't leave this without talking about credit cards. Credit cards are very fundamental in sustaining and in the credit system of America, in the financial system of America. When I came first, I was like, oh, let me, whatever I buy, I use my money to buy. But at a point, I realized that my credit worthiness will be dependent on my credit score or my credit rating. So it is incumbent that I make it a conscious effort to learn the credit system and to take advantage of it and to see how I can have an excellent, excellent score. So one of the things I looked at is I don't take a lot of credit cards, a lot of debt. Okay. So I had to secure, do a secure credit. I put my money in the bank and still took it from a 500 bucks from it and kind of secure, but my credit score was gradually increasing. Over time, I had a store credit, it was gradually increasing. I paid everything off. I had one credit card, I was like, let me use it to buy four. So I used the credit card to buy four and my credit was moving up. What am I trying to say? Do not use a credit card when you don't have the money. One. If you use a credit card when you have the money at stake, what it means is that if you pay, if you buy, if you buy some sort of credit card, you come back the next week and still pay with your money. Credit system is such that you are eating what you do not have. If you go to use the credit card to buy something and you cannot pay that thing with cash, what it means is that you are eating what you ought to have in future. So it means that you are enjoying your generational money you are likely to create because you, you, you'll be owing and you still have to pay. And where are you paying from? You are going to pay from future income that you are likely to generate. 
you know. So in that management, consider your credit card. So I would say if you have a credit card balance of 5,000 with 18% interest, and it's normally between 18 to 29% interest. And if you pay 200 months, a minimum of 4%, it will take you 32 months, almost three years to pay off. So, so here I was just trying to give a scenario where you, you have to increase your credit payment. But there is one thing, how do you tackle your debt? How do you tackle your debt? It is important to tackle your debt from the lowest. And so if you have maybe this cover, 500 bucks, American Express, 1,000 bucks, all what you have to do is to tackle from the low to the top. That gives you some leverage, that gives you some cash flow and the room to operate, okay? So make a list of all that, start to pay them off, like I said, you know, pay from the lowest. You know, your debt first, eliminate your debt. So like trimming bushes, you have to cut down one by one. Clear smaller first, debt is cleared, and extra to increase your dollar amount on a monthly payment. It is important to always do this. So have a mortgage prepayment. If you have a 30 year mortgage at 4% interest, 300,000, your monthly payment is going to be 15, 20. Now, if you put an additional of 500 into this payment, what it means is that you can pay off your mortgage in 18 years instead of 30 years. 18 years, two months, instead of 30 years. So the fact that I have a mortgage of 30, year, 30 years and my installment is 15, 20, it doesn't mean that if you have the capacity to pay more than 15, 20, or you just continue to pay 15 children, no. If you want to have leverage and cash flow in future, you need to increase that payment. And this type of payment applies to the same thing with car payment. If you have the capacity to increase that, I wish that you increase that, okay. Now, let me talk a little bit about budgeting. So normally, what does budgeting mean? People feel that budgeting is all about taking a calculator and trying to be very stringent in, the, in whatever you are buying and all that. No, 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 no. Budgeting sees that. Budgeting actually is your financial plan. Budgeting is your financial plan. It's basically a plan for the future. And it's a plan that prepares needs that a buyer prepare, prepare, needs to consider this. You have to consider internal and external factors. And you know, it is relevant for budget preparation. Okay. I, I always say it's about income and expenditure allocation. Where do we have to put what? You know, so budget is not about taking a calculator and uh, all these dollar amounts and try to pinpoint on it. No, it's about the financial plan, it's about how you want to build. That but so I want us to talk about the importance of budgeting. Um, Mr. Moderator, please, can you tell me how many minutes I have? Yes, you have. You have about sixteen minutes more, including question and answer. Damn. Okay. Cool. That's fine. Okay. So importance of budgeting. So budgeting helps you to control your spending. Budgeting keeps you on track for your financial goals. Budgeting can help your, your marriage. Budgeting, because when, you, when you're able to budget more, you have a, a great financial plan, your marriage, your wife falls secure, your husband falls secure because you, have, you are doing this together. And it's not like, hey, Annie, we have to do this. And you try to, no, no, no. You have a plan and you are going by the plan. I would show you a sample budget and how we can. Now, budgeting helps you to find financial contentment. Budgeting keeps you from finding financial overwhelm, being financial, okay. Budgeting helps you to avoid or get out of debt. Budgeting keeps you organized. Budgeting helps you to prepare for emergencies. Budgeting helps you to save money. Budgeting helps you get and stay ahead. Okay. So a case in point I raised about the grocery shops. If you don't need two pineapples for that week, don't buy two pineapples and waste it. 
it is important to know what you need and you are budgeted around it. And so that will help you be organized. You don't just leave food for it to be thrown away. If you don't need uh, twice of these, imagine you bought twice of these without a budget. You are going to throw them away because you, you don't really need it. So it is important to consider what you need. And so I always talk about the difference between need and want. So as a family, what do we need? Is it urgent? We need this. So it's a must for us to get this. We want this. If you want something, it's a future plan. It's a future, it's a, it's a goal. So you plan towards it to achieve it in the future. Oh, I want a new car. But you don't need a new car, but you want a new car. So if you want a new car, you don't just buy it. You plan around it, you budget around it, and you save towards it. If possible, you can set up and invest a, a, a money creating machine, which will, in a way, go forward, go, go to pay for some of these um, um, things that you want. Because when you're able to create these vehicles, it means that you are not squeezing from your fund or emergency fund. So let me, okay, so let, let, me, let me show us a sample, uh, a quick budget of a house. So there's a monthly budget plan. What I've done here, I have um, housing, which is taking the blue utilities, you know, taking this part, food, taking some part, so clothing, personnel, taking. So if you have this, you can know where my, most of your money is geared towards. Then you can identify if there are any leakages that you need to sort out in those areas so you can have a cushion to save. Okay. So let me quickly show you a sample budget right here. Okay. So this is your spending category, how the, the average household spends. So the sizes of these will tell you how much you have invested in, 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 the, in, the, in this category. So if you think that there's with your ways and means to reduce these areas of your spending, so every month you have to come, you can come back to this chart, you can come back to your spreadsheet. You can get a simple spreadsheet, look at your income, what you are getting, and you can look and you get your, you, you consider your expenditure. And that is all what I did with, this, with these graphs. So month on month, you can see that some of these things will change uh, depending on how we spend. So these things will change depending on how you spend in March, you know? And so this is how much you have left. So whilst you are spending every day, this particular arrow is either increasing or decreasing because it is telling you how much money you have if you are hovering around a budget of this. So this is your income part or this is where we are taking all our expenditure from. We have 3,500. 3, okay, and this is the list of our expenditure as a household. So whilst you are increasing your expenditures, this is reducing gradually. And so at this point, this is what was left. So if you continue to increase your expenditures to the foreseeable future, at the point you'll be running into negatives and all this will be wiped out and you'll be running back to your credit card, which is not the best practice. There are a lot of information I want to share that looks like I'm constrained with time. And so I would go ahead to talk about one important thing. So I'm just giving you the snapshot of budgeting. You have your income and you are taking your expenditures from it. We have your education or loan. Do you have your entertainment or food, drink, health, insurance, kids, and family? One of the things I want to tell us about the kids is that kids, they always, want, they always need some, oh, daddy, I need this. No, they want it, they don't need it. So it is important as a household to plan around it. Uh, inculcate the habit of teaching your children financial, financial literacy. With this, they, they come to terms with the kind of you know, expenditure they, they want to partake in. Listen, imagine that you tell, uh, you tell your child, Brian, you have 100 bucks. We are going for a shopping. You have 100 bucks. Um, um, Timothy, you have another 100 bucks. So these kids know that this is how much they have. When they go in to do the shopping and they see something that is costing 200 bucks, they ain't going to touch it because they know that they, what they have at their disposal is 100 bucks and they need to spin within that cycle. All this don't have to be factored in your budget. So that the kids right from the one, when they get to the shop, they are not just taking anything for them to cry. No, they understand the essence of a budget. They understand the essence of what is available to them and what they can do. So this is a sample of budget. Uh, okay, I have all these, let me, okay. 
let me let me go quickly here so we can investment. I cannot leave here without talking about all the money you have saved and what you can do with it. Let's look at the power of the talents. What I want to share with you is akin to the investment principle, the power of the talents akin to that. And if you have time, you can also look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse one to six, talking about portfolio diversification. So when you have your investment in overall, what you do is that you cannot put your eggs in one basket. So you will have diversify your portfolio. One, if you look at what makes I have here, I have stocks, I have bonds, and the stocks I was looking at S&P 500, which is the safest for a very a bit mature people, not too aggressive. And I have the money market, you know, I have real estate. But among these, the most assured and the most important, even though I had a, I had a mentor who said that, oh no, no, he is not, um, um, let me say, he's, he's, he's more like, uh, he's not like a pure Christian, but he understands and believes in God. Also, at least I know gold and silver, God made them, so they're always available. They, now, we can't do away with cryptocurrency in our generation. It's going to survive. But I have a, a mix, I have a, um, an audience mix, and so I don't want to talk much about it, but I want to talk about real estate. Real estate takes no money in getting this knowledge. I had, when I come back, I'll put my, my, my resources there so that you can appreciate it. Listen. You and your family can come together and say, honey, let's get a property. This real estate can be done in two forms. The real estate can be a cash flow investment and the real estate can be an appreciation investment. If you have a piece of property, all what you need is your deposit. Now, the banks are eager and they are ready to give you money to do real estate if you're only interested. And so for me, I'll always beg and plead with ACF members that Let's have real estate and let that is a foundation of our wealth. That is very important. Apart from getting the education, it's important to know real estate. It's important to invest in real estate. And if you have something saved up there, you're able to create a deposit, a property of maybe 400,000, and you put a deposit of maybe 20,000 or 40,000 or 50,000, you have this property at your disposal. Now, somebody is staying in, real, in this property. Pay your mortgage for you, and you are also getting a margin on it after paying the mortgage. So, supposing you have um, a property and the installment payment at the bank is fifteen hundred, and there's some somebody staying in this property and he's staying two thousand for you. What it means is that plus or minus, you should have a ca net cash flow of about maybe three hundred bucks or five hundred bucks every month. And mind you, that property is appreciating in value as the day goes by. If this person stays in this property, all things being equal, if nothing changes, and even, let's assume he's even still paying 2,000 bucks every month for you, and you're having a, a spread of 500 or a margin of 500, taking care of all these expenditures, you are building another cushion to get your next property and your next property and your next property. And all this is not your money. Your initial money is the deposit you put there for, for, for the bank. And mind you, this everybody can do. One thing you have to know is to get the knowledge. Listen, okay, no, no, I don't have time. I don't want to be you're wasting time on real estate. You don't have, okay, listen. You can get this real estate properties and have property managers. Property managers are in charge of whatever mass courses up in this real estate property that you have. You sit somewhere in, in your in, in your bosom and you are you sit somewhere at your corner where you don't want to monger yourself too much. And now they are transferring some cash flow into your account day by day. Every month they are transferring something in your account. Every month they are transferring something in your account. And this is building up. For 10 years, then, so that's why I'm saying wealth is created slowly. It's a slowly build. And so it's like um, you have a snowball. You, you start from the small and you continue to you continue to boil it up over time. And it gets to a point where it becomes so big. And that is where this world comes. So the real estate investment is something that I'm so passionate about. And as a, as if you're a working class, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a business person and you don't have time, Try to get yourself a property. You start with a property or two, if you're a family, and now you start to build that step by step, step by step. And I'm telling you, 
the sky will be your starting point. So real estate, real estate, real estate. If you, if you ask me of the three investment, then I say real estate, real estate, real estate. But there are a lot of people here. And so that's why it's important to get a mix. So if you want to invest in the stock market, if you are older, you don't want to be so aggressive. And so you go with the most secure companies, the S&P 500, you know, list of all these top blue chips companies where you can invest your money in. And probably you are getting an average of 8% in, in the year, which is not bad. Supposing inflation was around 3.5 and you are getting an average of 8% in a year, it means that you still make some spread. So it is important to also have a portfolio miss. But Anna, you have uh, about four minutes. We have some questions that I want to. Yeah. Okay, good. So I have put here the, some of the resources. And I think I, then in conclusion, creating money, making machine is a vehicle for wealth creation. Do you want to work for money or you want money to work for you? The latter is not sustainable in this journey. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur, but everybody can be an investor. Build your network. For your network is your net worth. Thank you so much and I appreciate the opportunity giving me. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a lot of information today. Uh, I mean, a lot of us, you know, it would take it, you know, quite a long time to recover from the a lot of information that has been thrown at us, but we have some few questions here. So let's begin with uh, the first question. And let me also say this, the section that uh, Kumana had earlier on, it was not meant you know, for us to take question, uh, but if we have time down the line, we can go back and, you know, or you can reach out to him personally. But uh, this is where our question section starts. We don't have a lot of time. Like we said, just put your question in the chat room and we'll see how far we can go. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so the first question is not really a question, it's a comment. It says sometimes you need to call the bank each time in order to add additional payment to offset your mortgage or else they may not use it for your principal. So if you want to add that little money to your mortgage, ensure that you just follow up with them um, to call them. Um, the next one said, you should say, you said something about building credit. Why building your credit? Do you need to spend up to 50% of what you have and pay back all same month? Does it tell good in your credit score? That is for you from Nana. Okay, thank you so much. So in the credit score rating, there's something we call usage, you know, and there are a lot of fact usage. So here, the person is talking about usage. It is not advisable to use 50% of your credit before you pay back, it's gonna hurt you. So it is important to always fall below 10% if you want to leave a balance on. I do not advise to use the credit and leave a balance. Listen, my, my utmost financial decade, my principle is that don't consume what you do not have. If you want to build a good credit score, try to operate below 10% of your credit limit. If your credit limit is say 5,000, don't operate more than 500 bucks. Make sure if you want to, even if you are living, that's when you are living a balance, not more than that, because it's going to hurt you. It's going to be counted as using higher usage, and that will not inure to increasing your credit. So always fall below 10%. Thank you, brother. And there's a question here. I think you already answered it, but I will just repeat it. I will condense two questions inside one if somebody said where is the best place to invest and there's also another question on uh on the graphs the graphs, the graphs. yes yes um i think you may want to share the graph um since the person would um we would give that opportunity for the person to speak up just to ask okay. the question. so which part of the graph the pie graphs okay Please, what's the question around it? Yeah, uh, you had two graphs. The first one was a lot more reasonable because this one that I'm seeing, the uh, rent and mortgage is so little. And from experience, almost half of my, uh, if you have that 3,500, I don't know which mortgage would take oh. that little. So, no, no, but no. the first graph you showed. 
the first paragraph you show was a lot more like what happens. No, um, I'm sorry. These are abstract figures. Whatever I put there, the, especially with the second graph, I just wanted to do more elaboration. So whatever you, figure you saw there. Okay, this one is figures. yeah. This one is more. But, but this one is, like, is part uh, of the presentation. You know, if you look at this one, it's part of the presentation. But the other one had to move to another cell to just show something. But with this one, it's part of my presentation, so I can speak to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Nana. Just to kind of you know catch up with a couple of questions here. Uh, somebody asked a question, like I mentioned, where is the right place to invest? And somebody said, how do I invest in bonds? And let me just also add from the first, um, when you started your presentation, uh, you talked about protecting your wealth. And a lot of us here in one way or the other have money in the stock market and knowing inflation is coming and how the market will react. I just wanted to also add, do, you know, is, are there vehicles like VIX that can help us with hedging um, just to ensure that you have a way to also balance whatever the stock market is knocking out based on how the market is reacting with a war or things that are happening. Okay, so it's, it's always important to have a portfolio mix and every investment portfolio is structured based on the needs and the goals and aspirations of the person. If somebody is 65 years, if somebody is 60 years and somebody is 20 years, my recommendation for investment portfolio mix will be different. Well, this means that if 20 years has a lot of time ahead of him, that he can be more a bit daring and more aggressive with regards to the rate of return and the risk that's associated with it. If somebody is 50 years, it means that this person has a little less time to actually retire. And so it is important to invest in probably, say, the S&P 500, where you have all these blue chip companies, where the rate of return might not be that high, but sustainability and security is worth it. Listen, in economics, one thing that we have to have to understand is that the market will not be stable. The market is very volatile. And so as a very smart investor, you should not be emotional about the market. Um, like you said, issues about hedging. I mean, yeah. So if you have a portfolio mix, you can buy some portfolios or some stocks and bonds that will make you hedge. That's irrespective of the shocks you are there. That is a very conservative approach, depending on your goals. And so you can also hedge in certain, you can even in risk real estate, you can invest in a rate if you don't have time to be doing all this property, property thing. But the big part of the real estate I like is that there are some tax benefits and tax incentives that you get. Why did Donald Trump never pay a lot of taxes, considering that he's a multi-billionaire? So it is important to know that some of these, if you get a property in your name and you are filing your tax, it's a great incentive to bring your tax burden down drastically. If you're having a real estate investment property or real estate property, your car can be paid for by the company. You don't need to pay your car from your own money. And so, and all these are tax write-offs. So it's important to also think in that direction. Like I said, with regards to the hedging, it's all based on the mix and based on the goals of the person, the age of the person will determine this kind of advice. Awesome. Thank you. I was just going to send the um, slide. Um, someone requested to have the resources shared. You can just take a screenshot or use your phone to take um, a picture for reference. So talking about real estate, interest rate is currently rising and the price of homes are equally rising. Do you think now is the best time to get into real estate market? Okay. So um, as with my background with data and analytics a little bit, um, what I would say is that now, the interest rates were just responding, the inflation was just responding to the low interest rate we were having. And so now that inflation has bumped up, the challenges are that interest is a bit of adjusting. The economy is trying to adjust itself. I wouldn't say that wait till everything comes down. It's that in real estate, at this point, it's about getting the best and a good deal. If they imagine, imagine it's okay, I'm waiting till everything comes down. And you go get a property where the person is depressed, the person needs support. A property worth on the market, say 400,000, but because it's a bit, little bit, you know, you, you have to make some repairs and all that, it's coming to maybe 200,000 or 150,000. This is a good deal. So this is based on deal on deal basis. I will not say that wait, 
there will not be any perfect time. Before, I was doing some analysis to ascertain when supply will exceed demand. But at this point, um, considering that we have supply chain challenges and global supply chain challenges, we still do not have enough materials to actually produce these houses to augment the demand. And so it will take a while for us to see supply exceeding demand with regards to the, the, uh, the number of houses we have on the market vis-a-vis -vis the people demanding it. So it's, it's this, my advice would be based on deal on deal basis. If you get a good deal, man, go get it. But I always say that be very conservative in your attempts. So, so. Okay, so this will be the last question so we can move on. Someone asked, as an individual, how much can you retain in your bank account? Because sincerely, I believe you don't get enough savings when you keep your money in the bank. Okay, so as an individual, what I would tell you to leave in your bank account only is your emergency fund or your emergency, something you are saving towards emergency. All your savings should be tailored measured towards an investment vehicle where you can topple up every month, where you can increase it every month, every month, every month, and that should be the strategy. Whatever should be in your account should be for emergency purposes. Emergency, because the point is that you have planned. If you have this budget, you have planned well, and so you know that 500 bucks is going to food, 200 bucks is going to my car, this is going to this, this is going to this, this is going to emergency fund. This is also going to my long-term goals. You know, So it depends on, on the plan. The budget is a financial plan. So it's not that uh, just uh, I'm going to buy food, so let me budget. No, it's a financial plan for the future. Thank you so much, Brother Nana. Uh, that was a very, very, very wonderful presentation. I mean, this is so vast and you covered so much yeah. within a short period of time. We want to really thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the effort, the knowledge, the wisdom put in, into this uh, presentation people are asking for your contact so uh, i would you know ask that you just help us uh, go ahead and uh, drop your contact in the uh, chat box and also you can as well respond to some of the questions that will be coming up uh, in okay the chat. okay thank you, good. So thank, thank you so much really thank you so much for your time god bless you all thank you thank you so much god bless you uh, round of applause, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, just help me take down your um, your slide. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. Very, very, very uh, informative. God bless you. So I want everybody, you know, wherever you are, please join me. Let's stand on our feet. I know um, it's already. So we just have to back up a little bit. Okay. Let's 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 back up. Everybody, get on on your feet. You know, I want you to stretch yourself. I want you to stretch yourself. So let's do this. Left, right. Don't hit your wife. Don't hit your wife. All right, let's raise it up. All right, let's bend down. Touch your toes if you can. Touch your toes. Ten. All right. And let's get up. All right. Stretch it like this. Stretch it like you're being handcuffed. Nobody's handcuffing you. All right. Okay. Let's get on our seat back. I just wanted to make sure that nobody is sleeping. We are getting to the next uh, section. So, honey, go ahead and uh, introduce to us our next um, speakers. Hello. Hello. And please remember to mute yourself. Hello. All right. So we are going to our next session. So this next session, we'll be talking uh, to um, the couple that you see on the screen will be speaking to us about love and grace in marriage. And Uche and Wachuku met in 2009 at Temple University, Philadelphia. While Wachuku was completing his master's program and Uche her bachelor's degree, they had their traditional marriage one year later and their church wedding ceremony the next year. They both moved to Houston, Texas, where they have lived for the past 11 years. 
Ucho works at Mackinson, where she's currently a research program lead, while Wachuku works at PwC as a senior consultant for the Salesforce practice. They have two boys, Ikechuku 7 and Chobachuku 3. They both enjoy traveling, serving in church, and most of all, spending quality time with the kids, teaching them the scriptures and how to worship. So without further ado, let us welcome these beautiful people that we see on the screen to <laughs> help us and tell us about what it means to have grace in your relationship. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Yeah, um, we'll just jump right in because we, I think we have 20 minutes. Can you all hear us? President Biden wanted that to happen sooner. Last hour, House Intelligence Committee member Mike Quigley explained. Um, can you guys hear? Yes. Happy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. With some feedback, uh, we'll start. Uh, we'll be talking about grace and love in marriage. Um, Martin reached out to us and he said he would like us to talk about it in the context of the COVID, the past two years, how yeah. how we've experienced grace and love in our marriage. But well, we want to start with a scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Oh, I've been read it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for from yourself, it is the gift of God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Um we we want to bring the scripture first because we talk about salvation, and a lot of times we forget that we are human beings, and when we say grace, we typically push grace to us, our faith, our Christian walk. Um, you go to church, you pray, you sing praise worship. But I feel that we need the grace of God in our everyday life. That is, that's what God is. That's one of the things it's, it's designed for. Grace really means unmerited favor. It's the favor that comes on you when you list, not just expect it, but deserve it. Um, I'd like to start with how practically how this has has impacted us in the past two years um i'll talk about us working from home for the past two years plus yep. um we've worked from home um both of us before covid we used uh, my wife would drive to work i i work from home my wife would drive to work and she'll come back and she'll experience some stress at work but by the time she gets home, she just doesn't want to talk about work, right? It's work is work, and we're home now. We have to face the other part of the daily life at home. So I never really understood what she does at work. I just know she goes to work, and she comes back, and sometimes, you know, she puts on a face like she's happy. Um, but for the past two years, I've come to see what my wife does at work. She does a lot at work. <laughs> Right. And uh, Pretty much. so we kind of the small house we have is the we, we converted the dining area to my office and a section of a master bedroom to our office. That way um, we don't get to interfere or disturb each other. There you go. Calls. Yes. Um, so but the interesting thing about it is, is I've come to know how loud my wife could be like when she's passionate about something like sometimes I have to walk into the room and, you know, just peep into the room and ask her, is everything okay because of the way you're talking? Um, but I've come to learn that that's just passion, right? You wanna talk about that? So, I mean, the passion can, you know, translate to, you know, the passion for work, passion for your marriage, passion for any relationship. So being in this leadership role at work, Sometimes that passion is for the people I lead. So it's not so that they are misunderstood or I'm misunderstanding what they're trying to say. It's more so that they know that I'm there for them mm -hmm. and the love and the guidance I still provide. But it's confusing for you, right? Because yeah. you know, you have to <laughs> you have to come in and say, are we still talking about coworkers? Yes, we are. And every now and again, you do have to explain. I do have to explain myself. A lot of them do know the personality yeah. that I bring and what I bring to the table. So it's not, of course, in a professional way, it's never rude. So, but when you translate that to the house and to the home, you and I have come to realize that the passion I have do carry through That's right. out the relationship I have here with us in our home 
and then at work and then the people that I care about then the family members and you know outside of the relationship there is still passion that's right and because that's my personality that's right so and and we've really experienced grace um I know we've been married uh, 11 years mm -hmm. and counting and I know that some people here married 40 years um and counting so you most of the people married for longer time can really testify that it's not really easy living in the same house under the same roof 24 7 with the one you love mm -hmm. right um we always say we want to spend time but the fact is the reality is that sometimes you just want to get away especially when you have kids um uh, particularly a three-year-old mm -hmm. who acts like his six or so um it's tough uh so we've actually come to cut some slack for each other. Some of the expectations I have for my wife, I have to right now be more practical about what I expect her to do towards the evenings. An example would be recently she got promoted to a um, the position of a uh, program lead uh, manager. And that's really taking a lot of time and effort and just taking so much from her. And before that happened, my brother had called me and said, this you should expect this because the role is really it's it's a stressful role especially the first couple of weeks or months mm -hmm. so i kind of mentally pre prepared myself so bringing that into practicality what i do is i'm asking god okay i'm working i also experience stress at work but i still need to support my wife i need the grace to support my wife so what do i do um, we've always never really said, this is your job, this is my job. We know something has to be done in the house and we do it. If you're available, do it. Um, so recently what we started doing is, uh, typically in the mornings, I, I'm a morning person, I get up, I get the, the kids ready. I take them, uh, she gets the kids ready and I get the other one ready and we, I, I drop them off at school. Sometimes in the mornings when I have to speak to international clients, it's pretty early in the morning, she immediately fills that role. She takes them to school. And then in the evenings, uh, especially Thursdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. Right, when I, I work, have to, you know, get ready for dinner and that's not ready, you take over. I, I just jump in the kitchen, you know, take care of the kids. So it kind of makes it work. Um, people from the outside would say, oh, wow, you guys are so perfect. Yeah. It's it's the grace of God, quite frankly. It is the grace of God. And, and one of the interesting thing is, she's also come to know and see how I am at work. Uh, she's come to understand um, by the end of the day, she's not the same expectations she had when I used to travel for work. But now I work at home. Both of us are in the house two, four, seven, round the clock, every time we're together in the house. So she's beginning to understand and see some of the things that she never really saw, that part of me at work. Interestingly, there's sometimes that I'll be on a call and I'm laughing and, you know, I'm giggling. And then she just creeps in and first of all, she said, Are you on mute? You know, camera. I'm like, no. She said, "Who is that? <laughs> Who is that person? Is that the woman? What's her name?" You know, and, and we laugh about these things because now she she gets to see that at home and at work, I have I kind of put on a certain personality at work. That's what's expected, especially in America. And you're working for a big corporation. Yeah, you have to put on a certain personality. So based on that, we've come to understand each other more. Quite frankly, in the past two years, I've learned more about her than I have in the, in, in the, the first eight years of our marriage. Right. Because now we're actually forced to stay together, to live our lives together, to raise these kids together. So going back to that scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, it says it's by grace you have been saved and it's not by your works. So for us, we interpret that, that the grace of God saves us by yeah. faith. And we need to be sustained by the grace of God, by faith. So every single morning we wake up, that time we wake up, we're just really tired. Um, we depend on the grace of God to take us through. Has it affected our relationship or our marriage? Of course it has, positively right. or negatively. I'd say positively because it's really made me, again, get to know her and get to feel proud of her. Like I talked about her passion when she speaks at work. Sometimes I just go into the room and I just give her a thumbs up, like, I like how you spoke because that, that shows confidence. And I think she also said this morning that she feels the same way sometimes when she sneaks by the my office section and then she she just simply gives me a thumbs up, like, mm -hmm. you know, this, I, this is my man. 
Um, so it's, we've really come together. I mean, COVID, you know how, what the Bible said, what the enemy had planned for evil, God turned it for good, right? COVID was, a, it is still a, a disaster. But if you're in Christ and you trust God and you stay in Christ, guess what? He turns those things around that were meant to destroy you and he helps, he uses it to build you. Mm -hmm. For us, it's really helped build our relationship. We speak to each other a yeah, certain way. Communication. The too. communication. Yeah. Communication is much better. Um, now I know she has an office tone and she has a home tone. Um, we all know that. We, uh, I don't need to explain that. The certain, certain things you, when you're in the office, there's a certain way you speak. Mm -hmm. um, when you're home, you kind of switch and you speak nicely or, you know, tenderly. Or, but we've, we've come to understand each other more. Um, I'm not wishing this COVID thing continues. Um, I'd like to get out of the house, not necessarily to the office, but, you know, I do that in the evenings. I just, some evenings I just drive around. Uh, but I really, um, it's come, it's made our relationship stronger. I've understood, I'm understanding my wife more. I'm appreciating her more. Um, uh, and, you know, being um, able to, decide make the decision and the effort to say okay we're both working from home we need to make our time for each other you know like a date night mm -hmm. um we've talked about this but you know when you have little ones you have to make plans for them to have babysitters but being able to consciously make those plans keeps the marriage and the relationship going because then you see that person also get dressed up and get ready to go out for dinner or whatever it is you guys have plans for. Besides, you know, sitting at home and mm -hmm. you Working. practically don't need to dress up anymore these days for work, unless you want to show yourself on the video camera. But you have to be conscious to say, this today or this month, we're taking a date once a month or twice a month. I don't know what people have time for, but I can speak for ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. We said once a month, and then as the kids get older, you can increase that number of time that you spend time with each other outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. And uh, we have a plan to ship other kids to go stay with the grandparents, you know, maybe a week, a month or so, so we can have some time to ourselves. And one last thing we'd just like to bring up is the love part of our marriage. Um, I like the fact that you, love is defined in multiple, in, in different ways. There's filials, there's agape. We all know that. But for marriage, for us in marriage, the love is becoming practical. For mm -hmm. us, it's practical. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things the Bible says in First, uh, uh, Corinthians 13, it says, love never fails. Mm -hmm. Love doesn't count to what's uh, count the evils mm -hmm. or the wrongs done. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that we are beginning to see more and more. And those of you that have been married for more than 20 years, you know this already because you see this person, you stay with this person all the time. You, you can't hide, you can't, you can't but see the faults, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the little things they do that just annoy you, those little things, those, you know, either you seeing Chrissy's that just jump in and, you know, during the day, but you always have to go back and say, I didn't marry this person because of this. I married the person because I love this person. And I believe love is active. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep acting on it. You just have to be practical about it. You just have to put the effort into it. She talks about going out late at, you know, dinners. Um, she loves it. I don't know, you guys need to see her in the evenings when she's ready for us to go on a dinner. We actually have a, a, a dinner tonight, right? Mm -hmm. we'll go on, I'm taking her out uh, early uh, uh, Valentine's. Valentine's. Yes. 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 That's right. So I, I'm looking forward to, you know, see my wife, you know, in that fresh look again. But so the love part of it is, is you have to make the effort. The fact that you're seeing this person every single day, every single day, you're hearing her talking, you're hearing him talk, you see him doing things. And sometimes she looks at me and she, she makes a, you know, a comment and then we laugh about it. Now we laugh about things more often. We laugh at each other. We make jokes about each other. And, you know, it's just been a great, great, great experience. And, and like the Bible said, the scripture we started with said, it is by grace you have been saved. Mm -hmm. Through faith, it is not your own doing, no, no. right? It says it is the gift of God. So only a smart person who sees the part that says it is a gift of God will sit back and constantly depend on God to provide that fuel, that, that grace, to keep loving your wife, to keep loving your, 
your, your husband through these very trying times, very trying times. The economy is not looking good. Every time you turn on the TV, there's someone hating the other person. You're either vaccinated or you're not vaccinated. There's just so many things going on. But you have to learn that this person, your spouse, your wife, your husband, you can always rely on that person. And we've been experienced in this. So we just want to, uh, we want to share that. And if you have a closing remark. Um, now, if we have, I don't know if we have time for questions or Martin is. Yes, we'll, we'll definitely ask you guys just, you know, little spontaneous questions. You know, okay. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Funny. Um, yeah, um, I, I think that's, that really sums it up. And of course, God being in the center of everything, Absolutely. just I cannot stress that enough. God being in the middle of all of this has helped us. Yeah. Someone said grace is God in the race. So you bring God into a race together. Yes. It, it, it just brings the grace and then trust in him because you can bring God in the, in the race and just tell him run on this track, run here, don't come here. But if, if you allow God to come in and you give him the room to do this, then trust me, it's, it's an amazing thing. When we, when we had a 10 year anniversary, it was unbelievable. Like my brothers called from Nigeria and they were like 10 years already. And right. we were still, we're still blown out that it's, it's 10 years. And she's looking younger, quite frankly. I'm looking older than, you know, she's, she's basically young in and I'm getting old. So I have to really hustle to keep up because uh, what I'm working with here is 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 amazing. So um, so I really appreciate her and I thank you, uh, Martin and 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 the team for having us share this few minutes. So um, we'll open the floor for for questions. questions yeah, um, as much as we can answer. We're still learning. <laughs> absolutely very beautiful I, you know this is just more like a love story that you guys have shared with us today your love story and we truly appreciate you for opening up mm -hmm. and just being transparent and just sharing with all of us i mean uh we're still learning you know uh for yeah. us young folks so um part of what i just wanted to ask uh both of you uh, at one point even with COVID having to share the same interface more often. At what point did you, you know, accept the personality of your spouse, of your husband? Take for instance, I mean, because this is something that I really struggled with, you know, <laughs> some of, you know, just, just accepting that this is my wife first, mm -hmm. accept that this is your package. Mm -hmm. You have to take your package as your package. Mm -hmm before mm -hmm. you start dealing with your package as somebody else package. So at what point do you both, you know, begin to understand and say, this is my wife. I need to accept my wife. I need to accept my husband for who he is and just give them the room to be who they are. Um, hmm, that's a very good question. I never thought about it. I would say maybe six months and it took me about that long because I was used to going out and coming in. He has always worked from home or traveled. So I would say it took me a minute because I would have to drive away for work or for lunch. And I'm like, I need, I need space. I just, I need to get out. And he's like, well, how long are you gonna be? I'm like, since when is someone asking me how long am I gonna be on lunch? So it took me a minute to get to that point where I'm like, okay, this is gonna work. We can, we can, we can do this because he would practically ask me detailed questions about work and you know how is it going and what's going on and you know and then I would share and I'll get tips, do it this way or you know respond to this email this way. So it did hit me that wow, this is my coworker. Yes, we're not doing the same job, but. It, this is something that I've probably been longing for, didn't know I needed, but didn't, didn't accept it earlier. So the sooner I accepted it, the better for me, which, like I said, it took me about six months to get that yeah. adjustment. Yeah, for me, for me, it was, it was actually earlier than six months. And that's because um, our 10 years, our 10 plus years of marriage ha has not in any way been, you know, smooth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, We've had uh, job loss, and which is, uh, I don't know how many people have gone through that, but um, 
I used I was in the oil and gas industry. So when the oil the oil crash happened, I was affected, and I lost my job for quite some time. And it was a really really challenging time. But the one thing that that stuck out like a soft one was her. Right, she was there. She was doing her normal work, and she would support me. I was doing photography. Whenever I went out to you know for gigs, photography gigs, sometimes every weekend. I'll be out Friday nights and coming back like 2 a.m. She was the one handling the kids. She was the one doing everything. Um, so those 10 years plus, we've had really challenging times that yep. I would say helped mold us, yep. right? Because I found out how much strength I drew from her. Quite frankly, I mean, I, I didn't know I could draw so much strength from my wife. Um, because she's more than a wife to me. She's my best friend, right? Yeah. She's my best friend. And, and I could tell her things. I would call her from my, I'm shooting an event and I'll take a minute and I'll call her. Just want to hear your voice. This is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And she said, did you take this? Did you take it? I'm like, yeah, you told me on time. But yeah. the fact that she was thinking about this was really helpful. So those moments that really molded our relationship. So when COVID hit, and, you know, the early stages, do we, okay, the first two weeks, stay indoors, mask up, do all that stuff. I was okay. I mean, there wasn't much, I mean, I was ready to get out of the house anyways. But as it, as it started getting longer, mm -hmm. I found out that I didn't have all that, those challenges I faced physically when I traveled. And there was a new set of challenge. Mm -hmm. And those new, the, the new set of challenges was accepting her, you know, 247. And... It, for me, it was it was a lot easier to accept that because I knew I would always draw strength for her from her. So that's really been a, my my experience um, since COVID hit. Thank you so much. That has been <laughs> even very amazing. I mean, we are getting all these beautiful comments. You know, people. Oh, thank you. Nice uh, from the chat. I I have one more last question for both of you. Uh, I'm yeah. going to condense two questions in one. Uh, with regards to love, you know, the area of love, how has, you know, you guys using the, the close proximity, turning it to strength, taking, take for instance, your children, because I know that, you know, that whatever you guys are doing, I actually, you know, just started reading a book that talked about genetics. And it says that the decision we make today, you know, kind of also will reflect in our children. How have mm -hmm. your children uh, been able to see the love that is growing between both of you? How has it affected the children, you know, growing in your house? And secondly, with regards to legacy, how has your parents and influence around you, your network, mm -hmm. you know, been source of strength to both of you in weathering all the storms that you guys have been through all through mm -hmm. the moment of your, you know, marriage? Um, I'll take the first one. Yes, right? um, the seven-year-old would probably understand a little bit more. I mean, the three-year-old just does not care about anybody else but himself. So, uh, so um, our first have seen, I mean, there are times where we're just worshiping and worshiping is something that we love doing in the house. Music everywhere, just mm -hmm. worshiping. E.K. Chukwu has picked that up. E.K. Chukwu, when he picks up his iPad, what he's listening to, elevation worship, or he's worshiping yeah. all by himself. Yeah. So he's seen us do that together, or you know, times where we pray at night, he would say, This is my turn to pray. He's just not saying mommy and daddy praying alone. He's like, Are we praying together today? Yes, we are praying together. We're praying as a family. Mm -hmm. So he's practically learned how to do the things that we do before they come along. Um, during our prayer times at nighttime, Ikech who has a time where he prays. And if you don't let him, he'll be upset. Yeah. So he's learned that from us. And we're continuing to teach them and show them, you know, the love. He sees me and daddy play fully, just, you know, you know, the other day we were playing and we we're just laughing. And he was like, guys, what's so funny? I want in on this conversation. I'm like, can we not, do we have to share everything with you? Um, so he, he can see us um practicing what we preach um not just working around and talking about relationship or marriage or mommy and daddy if it's not mommy and daddy in where we're going it's more like where's the other person if i'm away and he, i'm not home 
he asks his daddy every second, mm-hmm. where, is, where is mom? Like, when is she coming? When is she coming back? Why is she not here? So he's seen that family unit, and that's the, the, um, the love and the impression that that's what it should be. And we're continuing to show him that. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's very true. Uh, and to, to add to the second question about legacy, our parents. So my parents are back home in Nigeria, and they're very supportive. But right? my brothers, my, my dad, and my stepmom. And he's the last of seven. I'm so the last has, of seven. So I, I have five. Five, five brothers, brothers and, a sister. and a sister so everyone and, is great and they don't they don't joke with this woman mm-hmm. they they love her mm-hmm. they love her completely yeah. and starting with um the support from my family my side of the family which we typically call her in-laws because still the family she hasn't had any issues i mean the 10 plus years it's just love 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 yeah. and she always calls it out like, "Hey, I'm I'm so I'm so blessed to have a family like this." Yes. And my side of the family always tries to get involved in what's happening uh, on, side. on our side of the family. And, and forgive me for saying side of the family is just for explanation. We don't. As a matter of fact, my parents-in-law, my father and my mother, Auntie Lizzie, they don't call me son-in-law. They call me son. Mm-hmm. Right? There's there's no in-law or anything. If it if doesn't feel like there's uh it's we're glued. Yeah. And so in terms of the relationship I have and what we've seen trickle down, most of you, if not everyone here knows um, uh, Dr. Okay. Obiakwe and uh, uh, Sister Lizzie, which is my mom. Um, you already know her. You already know him. You, you, you guys know them and you know what to expect. Yeah. So imagine what you expect, multiply by a hundred, and then fit me into it. That's what I'm experiencing. We have, when I say all the support we need, uh, spiritual support, uh, financial support, emotional support, mathematical, English, Spanish, German, every form of support we we need, we get from them. We can call them at any point and we're sure that they will respond always positively. And one other thing we wanted to call out, the last point is, our son didn't speak for for four the years. first four years, yep. uh, and that was one of the roughest times of our relationship in, in our marriage. It was really tough. But the fact that we had our parents on both sides constantly checking in, it just made it feel like we were not alone. Yes, exactly. um, And we've seen families that have had similar things. Um, by the way, he speaks, he's seven now, he speaks, he talks like a news reporter. And, but we've seen families that have had similar uh, situations, some kind of challenge with, you know, developmental challenges. And we've seen how that has really either ripped the family apart or created a chasm and or some kind of issue. Yes. But for us, and statistics it does, say, does say that that's actually the number one number thing. Number one that, thing that breaks marriage. Yeah. When you have a, a yeah, child with, child with development challenges. Okay. But in our own case, when it happened, the Lord used our families to really keep us together constant prayer constant checking in and we are so so appreciated we have the template yeah. of what to give our children our parents have handed the templates to what we've seen them practice it we've seen it now we have the template and we're running with that generational thing and we will pass it to them and they will pass it to their children's children because that's what the bible says the lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you, you know, generational blessing. That's what we're experiencing. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much you. for being here. I mean, it is such an encouragement for, you know, young couples, maybe those who are married for two years, one year, or those who are yet to get into marriage. I believe that this testimony that you guys have shared a, you know, will be such a support system, you know, as much as we remember, you know, that it's all about grace, that love at some point may fade, you know, not the love in parentheses that the love that is God, but the feeling of what we call love at some point may begin to fizzle away, but the grace of God will just continue to pour into that love. So mm-hmm. thank you guys for sharing your beautiful story once again. God bless you and your family. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thank this you. This is a good way for us to go on a little break.
Um, isn't that awesome? Um, there's a lot of comments here. We also encourage you to just go to the chat and see how um, the wonderful um, comments people are leaving for you guys. Someone right. said, wonderful couple with meaningful testimony. Grace really triumphs. Amen. And also, I just love the way you put in the grace and the race. That Amen. is awesome. We thank God for his grace. And um, we are so grateful that we are all here Amen. experiencing the grace of God. Isn't that awesome? Yes. So we are going to go on a 20 minutes break. 20 minutes. We've chopped 10 minutes of our time. So I would just encourage us, I mean, whatever you can get done in the next 20 to 25 minutes, maybe we can you know, give them 25 minutes, honey. Well, it's okay. Yeah. Well, 25 you. minutes, let us be back, okay? Go get um, lunch, food, yeah. have fun. We'll yes. see you back in 20 minutes. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Let's just give one more minute to, to get people who are still to, to round up. I mean, if you are still eating, that's fine. Uh, you can just- um, I just finished taking my tablet, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so- um, I, don't, I don't think he gave you, she gave you a tablet because you'll be sleeping. <laughs> no, I'm not sleeping. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So we have uh, more coming up and uh, we want to welcome all of us to the second section of this program. Uh, let's go ahead and just pull up our program again. Um, right now we are back uh, before we continue with uh, the worship section again. I want to use this time to bring in our brother Celestine Joko, he will be, you know, making some announcements with regards to our regional conference that is coming up. So, brother Joko, if you are ready, this time is uh, yours. And after that, we'll be taking another uh, round of worship section with brother Budo. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right, very good, very good. We Praise God. We can hear you. Okay. Praise Almighty God. I want to thank uh, everyone that have uh, so far spent their time and labored to bring this program together this, uh, this afternoon and this morning. Praise God. Thank you very much. It's a calling for all of us to come together. What an experience. And that's even the more reason why we are calling everyone that have uh, not uh, booked up their hotel or registered for the conference coming up uh, July 1 through the 4th in Oklahoma City. The president will put up the information out as I speak. We are asking each and every one of you who have not registered to please uh, here to the call, we need you. We want you to come to share the experiences that we are having here today, even to make it uh, more appealing that uh, July 1 through the 4th, we're having our conference. We are the, the largest uh, region in the country within ACF. I believe we're the most powerful. We're the most blessed. I will say that. So we shouldn't have any problem uh, meeting the minimum number of uh, our contract with the hotel. As of uh, yesterday, we only have 35, 35 people who have registered. And so we are calling on uh, at least those who are here, we need at least minimum of 45 people to register within this uh, coming week so we can meet at least the minimum that is uh, required from the hotel according to our contract. So, brethren, 
we're calling on you to come and uh, be a witness to the conference we are having coming up in this, uh, this year's conference, South Region. And uh, again, we need you to register. We need you to book your hotel. The hotel is only $85, incredibly cheap, amazingly cheap, unbelievably cheap as an embassy suite. So, and the chapter, Norman OKC Metro chapter is doing everything they could to welcome you, to make it a more pleasant experience, but you gotta register, you gotta book your hotel. And so the president, could you please put up the, if you can, the information about the hotel so that you can go online to register. You can ask, uh, I mean, call the hotel directly to register. And the fact that uh, the hotel is not within a walking distance to the nearby or nearest hotels, that means if we do not make up the minimum, and if we do make up the minimum, if we don't make it on time to allow us to go back to the hotel to get more rooms, then if you do find a hotel close by, it will be twice that price. And it won't be in a walking distance. You have to drive. We don't want that experience. So that's why we need to have everyone place to book your hotel rooms to register. That way we'll have enough time to go back to the hotel to ask them to give us the same rate for any additional rooms. So that, that's, that's very, very important, extremely important because the hotel isn't very willing to accommodate us with that same rate of $85. As many of you may have uh, experienced, uh, hotels are more expensive now than they were two years ago, okay? And so that's why we need to get as many people to book their hotels as quickly as possible so we can go back to them if we need to do that. So I, you know, we are pleading with you, we are calling on you, everyone that's here today, please book your hotel and register. May the Lord bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And, and for those who may not be members of ACF, maybe you saw this uh, uh, conference over Facebook or Instagram, or somebody just told you there's a conference going on and you're wondering what are they saying? So this is an organization, ACF, African Christian Fellowship. And uh, we have, you know, different branches all over United States. And this is um, the South region uh, body. And that's on the platform that we are hosting this conference. So it's not an individual program. This is not a program for Martin and Chandy. This is ACF program. And you can plug in and join us and be part of us. And perhaps you are just new. We welcome you to join us. At this time, I want to... Um, uh, call on us to uh, give to God. And as we do that, even though it's not stipulated in the program, uh, but we all know that this program is free of charge. We want to make it accessible for everybody. There is no price tag attached to it. And you know, when you go for a conference, definitely they will make you register, pay something before you get in. But in this case, this is all for, you know, for free. But at the same time, we want to give you an opportunity to support and be a blessing to ACF. And uh, the president will be putting up uh, information on how you can give. As we may not have this to last for a long time, if you can take a picture and just capture you know, uh, the screen right now. Okay. And I will also encourage the president to put it on the chat room so that we all can uh, just have that. You can give through uh, Zelle, you can give through Cash App, 
You can yeah, yeah. give, you know, we have many ways that you can give. You can mail your check. So the address is right here. And um, as you do, may the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you as you give. So at this time, before we go on with the program, I want to bring in Brother Udo Tassi once again. Uh, let's give him the platform. Over to you, Brother Udo. Mm -hmm. uh, hallelujah. Um, so I'm um, still in the mood of worship, just like that song that just played. Um, says I will be content in every circumstance. I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira, you are enough. Jaira, you are enough. You are Jaira. You are enough, so I will be, I will be content in every circumstance. I will be content in every circumstance, so I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira. You are enough. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come, I come to thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come, I come to thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come, I come to thee, oh, bless me now my savior i come i come to thee i need thee oh i need thee every hour i need thee oh bless me now my savior i come I come to thee, create in me a clean heart, and purify me, and purify me, create in me a clean heart, so I may worship you. Cast me not away from your presence. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation so that I may worship you. Cast me not away from your presence, God. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation so that I may worship you, so that I may worship you, so that I may worship you. Cast me not away from your presence and please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation so that I may worship 
What a blessing, what a blessing. Thank you, Brother Udo. You know, when we talk about legacy, you know, as we were just ministering, you know, my mind just went back to Uncle Emetasier. You know, he was one of the people that God used to start this organization. And today you are here blessing us. I mean, that is all about what we are talking about. You know, God bless you and bless your family. Thank you so much, Brother Do. I mean, I just feel like leaving you to just continue to take us into worship. And I believe everybody feel the same way. Let me make this statement before we go to our next section. Um, when we talk about our conference, I know uh, Brother Celestine uh, mentioned about reservation. So I will request, you know, Mr. President, if we can put a number of somebody that we can contact to help us navigate that. And when we say reserve, reservation, it doesn't mean you have to pay now. The simple thing is just for you to call and say, I am coming. You can even pay when you get there. So don't say because I have not been able to, you know, gather the money. You can just call in. All we are trying to do is to make up the number of people who are coming to help with the, you know, the process to make sure we secure the prize and all of that. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, let's put a number on the chat room uh, where uh, somebody can reach out and call. Hand over to you. All right, so we're going to welcome our next speaker, all speakers. They are, go, they are um, student panel and Dr. Chineku Obiodo would um, be hosting this next section. The topic um, for this section is mental health among African immigrants. Dr. Chineku Obiodo is a child evangelist with over 25 years of experience in children and youth ministry. Her multicultural and multi-ethnic ministry spanning two continents has involved direct ministry to children and youth from over 16 different countries. She is the state coordinator for the Children Evangelism Ministry, CEM in Georgia. So let's welcome Dr. Chineku Obiodo, PhD. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Can, you, can you hear me very well? Yes. yes. 
Okay, so just give me a minute. Um, I actually do need to pin a few people on the screen. So um, if it's okay to take me off pin so that I can get, um, I can see the other people to, to um, add to the pin. Uh, so I, I'm not the co-host. Can you co-host me? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Bramano? Yes. So first um, we cannot first. do okay. yeah. You're on now. Okay, yeah. so I'm co-host now. Okay. Um all right, just give me a, a second. I just want to add um my panelists and then we can go ahead and get started. Um okay, and I think. That covers everyone that is on my panel. Um, so welcome everyone again, or basically good afternoon ACF family. It's indeed a pleasure to join you guys again. I uh, bring greetings from myself and I'm sure that um, Dr. Okoro and Sister Susan from Macon have also um, shared their greetings. Um, today we're here to share with you guys a very important topic. This is a topic that you all uh, know that I'm very passionate about and I have shared on with you um, on several occasions. Today I have, like I said, very special people with me. We're going to be having a student panel focusing on the mental health of African immigrants specifically youth, but we'll be talking about parents as well. So please join me in welcoming Divine Madibuike. He is a, a freshman at Mercer University studying pre-law. Is Sharon Muenda. She's a global health senior at Mercer University. There is a former Mbanaso, who is a sophomore studying global health. And there is Temba Nsubuga, who is studying uh, pre-farm and majoring in chemistry. So I uh, thank you all for coming. So this topic of mental health is a very sensitive topic. One that, especially in our community, the African community in the US, we don't quite have a handle on. And if I am you know, to be quoted right, I would say that we actually um, avoid this topic, which is a sad thing because everyone suffers from a mental health situation, right? At some point in your life, everyone suffers from it. Well, my first question has to do with, you know, young people. And I'm throwing this question to the panel. Do African immigrant youth face mental health stress that is above and beyond what the average young person in America faces? And if so, what are some of the sources of distress? To answer that question, of course, African youth in this country face the most stress out of any group in America. There is a compounded effect with being an African immigrant in this country, with the experience of being Black, and also the stresses that come with African parents. And oftentimes in African households, a topic that doesn't get discussed enough is racism and being Black in America. To, to truly analyze how race and racism plays a part into our socioeconomic status in this country, our academic status and education, but also how we're treated by law enforcement and other organizations in America. That's a topic we don't talk about in African households because we still hold, all, hold on to our African values from back home. But once we immigrate to the Americas, we have to realize that we're in a different land filled with different ideals, different cultures, and different views on race. Hmm. So you're saying that um, there are two things you're saying there. There's a source of stress uh, from just being a Black youth in America, right? And then the other aspect of stress is the fact that in the African home, these aspects of Blackness in America are not necessarily discussed or highlighted in a way that supports the young person. Is that what you're saying? That is exactly what I'm saying. Okay. 
And in addition to uh, what he was saying is that um, one of the biggest sources found within African youth, as well as uh, the parents, is the miscommunication uh, between the parents and the ch uh, their children. Uh, you should always recognize that children do not, the African children uh, in America don't end up growing the same way as uh, their parents did back at home. And this is very important because parents, uh, children end up developing new ideas, uh, even new skills, which they want to convey uh, to their parents. These are often powerful ideas on how they grow up and also answers to life's biggest problems. But what we often see is that uh, parents uh, sometimes cannot provide the answers uh, for their children because uh, they might not understand exactly what they're going through or the, the children might not understand what they're uh, trying to teach them. And it's uh, very important to realize this because children end up needing that parent to be their strong livelihood uh, mm -hmm. uh, link and bind and bound between them because that's their main uh, uh, caregiver. Mm -hmm. And this is important also because uh, children need someone to relate to for some of the biggest experiences that they go through growing up. Mm -hmm. And you often see that with African youth is that they relate to other people or other outlets of comfort uh, to provide them a, uh, clear and clarity, uh, clarity and as well as um, supervision. So basically this affects their mental health, right? Exactly. The inability to communicate or find the words to interact with their parents and share what they're exactly going through. And on the other hand, maybe their silence may make their parents think that everything is fine. Exactly. And Where they're silent because is. they don't know what to say. They don't know what to say. Thank you. Yes, African youth go through extra mental stress. Another source is African comparing the situation to those they left back home. The African perspective of some of the African, the African perspective of America is that a land filled with opportunities. For this reason, people around your circle may, for this reason, people around your circle may have high expectations for you to be extremely successful and this might lead them to be blinded by the challenges you're going through or that are so post in this new environment mm. so if we head out very well you're talking about the fact that when you migrate to america whether you are you were you know you were born in africa or not people at home have a different kind of expectation for you you know to either buy them nice things or to say things or to be in a certain way and your experience in America doesn't give you a lot of those uh, liberties. And because of that um, misrepresentation, it affects the mental health of young people? Yes. Hmm. Oh, thank you. I also agree with my peers. African immigrant youth face a lot more stress in comparison to their American peers, one of them being the push to achieve high academic success, especially in paths or being made to study such things or such mentally tasking and rigorous topics such as pre-med, pre-law, engineering, and so on. And these topics we may personally not even be interested in or invested in, but because we're told that it's for the greater good of our family and for making sure that they and us lead, live stable lives, we have to put our mental health aside and basically push ourselves through the mental strain of such rigorous um, schooling. And these parents also often don't understand how different the American college system can be, especially if they never got so far in their education in, in Africa or the, they only received college education in Africa. Hmm. So are you saying that it is this pressure of the pre-med or the high, you know, any majors that, that affects them, or is it the fact that they are pushed in those directions? I think it's a bit of both, because that push and not being personally invested can leave one to not necessarily put their all in it, and the fact that they're studying such things that needs so much attention, such things like that are very complicated. If you're not coming with the energy to truly invest yourself in studying pre-med or pre-law, you're not mm. going to do so well as somebody who's truly devoted to it. Mm. And that compounds your mental health, obviously. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course. Mm. So based on what you guys have shared, it, it looks like the parents are, are very um, a major source of mental stress for young people. 
you know, starting from what Divine shared and Timber and, um, and then you former, it looks like the parents play an interesting role. Is that so? Yes, our parents can play a huge role in our stressors in our lives. I remember growing up, our parents would sometimes or oftentimes compare academically with our achievements. They would compare our siblings' grades and they would compare each other with our A's, what we earn in, in school. And this led us to view our, our siblings not as family members, but rather competitors, competitors that we had to step over into achievement, into, into validation we received from our, our, our parents. And so academic comparison is not a good thing in an African household. It can actually lead to siblings looking at each other as rivals rather than family. Wow, wow, isn't that something? And that can be stressful also for the young person, right? Hmm. It is very stressful for the young people. Hmm. Yes, also to add on to what he has said, African parents can also contribute to the mental stress African youth go through. Majority of African parents believe that education is the only key to success. They put so much pressure for their children to go through certain pathways such as medicine, law, or engineering, and to do extremely well without realizing that majority of, that some of these students may not be gifted in those areas. So this might contribute to the stress of um, African youth trying to meet the expectations of their parents and it can increase their mental strength. So, yeah. Wow, sorry, my light went out. So based on what you guys have shared so far, I mean, I've had pre parental pressure. I've had parental comparison. I've also had things about um, com uh, yeah, comparing siblings against each other comparing you with other people, and also the cultural adjustment in the US being interesting sources of mental stress. Does the parent's mental health status play a role in this? Do you think the mental health status of African parents contributes to why they are featuring as a major source of stress for their children? Yes. Our parents' stressors in their lives and their mental health has a compounding effect on us as their children because number one, we love them, they're our parents and whatever they go through, we go through as their children and whatever they're going through in their office and their personal lives, they also bring back home into the ways that they discipline us, they parent us and how they act with us. And so any mental health stress or stressor that they face gets passed down to us both emotionally and also genetically as well. Hmm. Wow, now this is serious, genetically, wow. Okay, so you're telling me that the stressor that the child carries, one, there's a stress of being a young person, an adolescent or a young adult. Then there's a stress of being a young adult in America. Then there's a stress of being black in America. Then the stress of being in an immigrant home, right? Dealing with all these communication issues, the extra pressure, the extra comparison. But also you're telling me that on top of all this, young children have to deal with the mental health fallout of their parents. Meaning their parents' mental health does not get taken away by the doctor or taken away by the therapist, but is downloaded as an extra layer of stress on the same children. Please. Can you confirm if what I'm saying is correct or my observation is correct? Yes, it is very correct. Does anybody have a story? Too. Yeah, go ahead. Does anybody have a story about how their parents' mental health impacted their lives? Yes, and for my situation, the impact of my mental on the impact that my parents had on my mental health as an African immigrant youth is that by being forced to pursue such avenues or paths that I wasn't personally interested in, there was a feeling of loss, especially of self-identity. It's very suffocating to feel like your life is in yours to live. And the feeling of, or the controlness from my parents also seeped into my social life. They made it very hard for me to visit friends or visit people that I knew from college. There was one summer, just last summer actually, where I came back to my hometown and I saw two of my friends in the same week and to them that was too much for them. 
they are very, they feel like America is very debauched and very uh, corrupt in comparison to the Nigeria that they grew up in, which they are more understanding of and they feel is very safe. So when they see me mingling with things outside of Nigerian values, they feel threatened and they feel afraid. And because of that, I, had, I couldn't visit anybody else that summer. And the compoundness of all of that on my mental health is that I feel like I can't pursue anything independently of my family, that my identity depends on who my parents want me to be. And if I am to be myself, if I am to, to depict, depict things outside of what is their Nigerian values, then I am seen as possibly less than of a daughter to them. Wow. Yes. Wow. So clearly, mothers and your parents' mental health, in the sense that they haven't quite, you know, adjusted or accepted the fact that they're living in a country with multiple, mm -hmm. you know, values and facets. And yes. they are kind of using their control over you as an outlet to deal with their own mental health stress. Yes, that is definitely the case. Okay. Well, let's continue to talk about the impact. What impact does this mental stress have on young people? Temba, do you mind ch chiming in here? Yeah, so uh, impact can be in uh, multiple areas found within the youth and as well as uh, uh, the parents. And I would like to at least provide a personal story on this encounter. Uh, one of the main things that we sometimes see in multiple uh, um, aspects is that uh, the, there's a cultural loss of connection. So all my family, we grew, were born in Uganda, we, but we always we all immigrated here. And what we often found is that uh, uh, my brother, God bless his soul, he was the sole heir of our family regarding uh, our clan customs. And my parents put extremely a lot of pressure on him growing up that you have to follow these clan codes, make sure you follow this, make sure you don't do this, that, and the other. And I had to witness that. And it was an overload of stress on my brother in which he had, he developed a mental condition. He developed a schizophrenia uh, in which he had to take medication for. So it was, the impact of that is that all that build up stress, all of that, that he had to go through, he decided he, in order for him to be better is that he had to lose some of that cultural connection. He decided to be, uh, to relate to more things here in America. One of those examples, he, he related to his friends more. He related to American customs as well as customs like even Native American customs because he felt scared that it was unhealthy for him to even tie to back to his uh, clan roots in Uganda. So uh, that was one of the major impacts that I, I had to witness even growing up. And it might be similar to other uh, African youth might end up growing up with too. Can you tell us more about what happened to him? So he developed schizophrenia and what later happened? So the schizophrenia for him, uh, the medication he takes is A, it's very expensive and B, it has uh, uh, very inducive side effects. And those side effects um, uh, end up for him, he, his metabolism rate has, is usually extremely low. And he actually takes this medication for a long time and sometimes at a double dosage because it did get that bad. And, you know, he became, he developed obesity. And then later, uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, uh, the sad news that he passed away of a pulmonary embolism because he had a blood clot that just went through his lung. And he said the main cause of it is, you know, I was talking, you know, you talk to physicians in the hospital and they said that medication caused it, uh, that obesity. And, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's the reason why I started pharmacy to this day is because I wanted to make sure I know the root cause of many things. And also I want to figure out better solutions so that people don't have to go through what I had to. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank you for sharing Timber. But if you ask me, the real root cause of the death of your brother is not the medication. It, it was the pressure. That's, it was, that's what I say. Yeah, I say that all the time. Medication is there to help people, but what my brother had had gone through was not helping him at all. Um, he did not have to have that pressure. He did not have to carry that stress. He didn't have to go through all that. And if the story is to tell anything, children at the commute should not go through what he gone through or anything similar like that. Thank you. Divine? 
there's a huge impact. And one of the most simple impacts is academics. Whenever in, in African households, the sole purpose of us being in America is to focus on our academics. But outside of our academics, we don't get the aspects of culture. We don't get the aspects of hobbies, extracurricular activities and hanging out with friends. And whenever we're not in academic mode, we feel a loss of emptiness. We feel empty and we feel like our purpose here in America is not being fulfilled. And so the biggest impact of this is our emptiness whenever we're not focusing on our academics. Hmm. So that means that you just don't feel, have a sense of purpose when you're not studying or when exactly. you're not competing with somebody else. Hmm. Yes. And is that stressful too? That is very stressful. Hmm. Sharon, what's your take on this? Yes, I definitely agree with what Divine has stated. I have a personal example is that I had to drop out of, a, out of, out of my classes for a semester because I was incapable of continuing with my school, with my classes because of the extreme mental stress that I was going through. I grew up believing that education is, is really important for one's success in life. And seeing myself doing, doing extremely poorly on my school life really impacted me. I felt so lost and I felt so useless for a period of time. So I definitely say it does impact one's academic life. Hmm. So this is kind of connecting to what we had shared earlier. So basically you were going through difficulty in school and because of that pressure or that standard that has been set for you that you must do well and without success, you, there's no hope for you, you ended up dropping out because you didn't see yourself doing well in school and you didn't see yourself being able to accomplish the goals that your parents had set. So it actually, the pressure worked the negative way for you, right? And you lost a whole, um, a whole uh, semester because of that. In fact, now it's going to be a whole year because of that. Interesting. Yes, I went through periods of time of feeling hopelessness. So yeah. Yeah, hopeless. Okay. Well, now let's, we're almost rounding up. Let's look at the long-term consequences of this impact. So we've established here that indeed African immigrant, you go through extra mental health stress that has the major source being actually the fact that they're immigrants and growing up in an immigrant home. And then you have the pile up of other effects going on around them. And we've also established the fact that the impact is, is incredible. There is an emotional impact. There is a physical impact, even almost up to death. There is a, 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 an intellectual impact. There is a mental impact. What is the consequence? What are some of the consequences of these impacts? The consequences of these impacts on African immigrant youth, especially the impact of not feeling seen or validated in our personhood is that we seek this validation elsewhere, elsewhere. And in the form, or for African immigrant women especially, this manifests in the form of seeking this validation from men. Because when we're, to we're told that that's the next best thing if we're not able to get that validation from our parents, from our father. And we're, when we are in that vulnerable position, we believe that any man that's like willing to listen to us or see us in what and how we exist, we believe that they have good they have the best intention for us, basically. And we give ourselves to them. And this doesn't really take into account how some of these men may use this information and see that we are in a vulnerable state and use it to their advantage to manipulate us and use us, basically. And this leaves African immigrant women in a more vulnerable position than they were beforehand. Wow. Oh, wow. The need for validation. Right? Who's next? Who's going to speak next? Right. One, one, of, one, one another, another consequence of mental health is, um, among African youth, is low self esteem. I had a close friend who had experienced a long period of mental illness. This led her to have so low self-esteem and shutting people around her, around her off completely. It affected the beautiful relationship we had. And from this day, that relationship has never impact, has never recovered. It also had a negative effect on me because I was losing somebody very special to me in my social 
life. And we all know that social life is important for one's well-being. So not only does it impact you as your own individual, it also impacts people around you. Wow. So this is now another layer because it's one thing to suffer from stress that comes from development, another stress from immigration, another stress from parents who are Africans, another stress from parents who have mental health issues that they don't take to the therapist or they don't take to God. Now you're having to deal with the fallout of the mental health stress of your other friends who would have been the people who would have, you would have gone to, to for support, but here they are missing. Here they are, they are sick because they are going through the same thing. So we go back again to the fact that the African immigrant youth is sitting, is existing in the context, in the world of incredible mental health stress, a lot of times un, un, unknown even by their parents. Is that true? Yes. Very. Uh, Temba, what do you have to uh, share on this? Oh yeah, uh, and then another thing is, Another consequence of all of this, all that we've just you know talked about, is that um, uh, sometimes we, as youth, have to go against what our parents are going, you know, going, you know, providing towards us. You know, the strict customs they want us to go through, and the ones, you know, us who have strength to go against them, end up having what our parents feel as as rebellious, but what we feel as you know, we're just trying to live out our lives. And a personal example that I also want to present. Uh, it's just for relationships in general. So uh, high school, even through college now, I had a relationship with a girlfriend I wanted to date. Uh, the biggest factor that kind of caused disruption is that I'm dating a white girl. And my parents made sure that I should not date her, see her. They tried their best in every circumstance. And obviously, this is someone I really loved at the time, and I want to see her any kind of way. And I had to sneak back, you know, I had to open my window, jump out the window, run, or even drive my car really quietly to our house and be undercover. You know, the first 13 months of our relationship, my parents didn't even know what was exactly happened because they didn't know I was dating. They said, you know, okay, you're not going to date this person. And then, I, you know, I guess the final straw is I took her back from, you know, from high school, brought her back home and said, this is her you're going to meet her now and obviously they don't want to shout at her and they had to forcibly uh change their mind about these things and it sucks that it ha how that happened but now they love her they don't mind talking to her anyway but at first they had a huge grudge against her in which they would said you're supposed to marry a ugandan girl go back home I understand someone you know who even deals with ugandan customs which some of us some of which i don't agree with you know and now they're starting to learn about that, but uh, it didn't have to be that kind of way, you know? Wow. I mean, if we keep talking, more things keep digging up, right? So in this case, a consequence of it is really that that kind of tension in your relationship with your parents, and you almost find a way you don't see eye to eye, and you, you were jumping off the window. Some people leave the house and never come back. So a consequence of this stress is that we can, parents can actually lose their kids, right? They could be present at home, but they're just not there because something is, is missing, you know? Well, and I would like to uh -huh. add one more thing. And, uh, and this person I was dating was not a bad person at all. She had straight A's. She was number three in her high school class of 950 people. Uh, she's at the same university as me and she's a presidential scholar and she has a 4.0 GPA. There was nothing wrong about it that um, she, she, she did or don't, did nothing wrong or convey anything wrong. So it was very hard to at least communicate with. Yeah, I can see how it would have been hard because it's the same parents that are telling you to do well, to be, to be good, you know, and um, to also, you know, do well in school. And here you have this young lady who is doing all that. And you really don't understand why um, your parents are so against that. And sometimes parents just need to explain what's, their, what's on their mind. But before I talk about what parents need to do, we are rounding up here. The last question I have for you guys is, so what do we do about this? What are some specific approaches and solutions that you guys will offer you know, in, to address this situation of mental health stress in the African immigrant uh, family? I think the simplest solution is having open dialogue, having open dialogue between the African parents and also the African youth. 
and actively listening to your children and their experiences in America because their experiences in America is totally different to what you experience in Africa. And they're both valid in their own right. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, and, then, and another solution we should also see is that um, you should always recognize that success is different for everyone. Um, you know, what my parents what deem, my parents deem as successful, deem as successful is, different, is than different than what I deem as successful. But uh, we should, as parents, I guess parents should be uh, respectful in which they should show them towards the light direction, you know? Um, and usually you find this in different aspects, you know? We, in a Christian household, you want to lead them towards the light side of things. Don't steer them towards evil forms of success. But in this case, allow them to learn what they think is successful you know, career-wise, relationship-wise, even friendship-wise, but just be like their cheerleader towards a positive direction. Don't force them to go one direct direction, but allow them to toss them to a direction that's uh, positive in all aspects and also not evil or anything bad, because that way you can develop a better relationship with the, uh, with the parents as well as the youth, and they can even develop one concept which is extremely important, which is trust. Trust is extremely important. That's something that should be linked between the youth and their parents. Because if trust is not there, then it can lead to uh, many uh, unfortunate uh, circumstances. Thank you. And Sharon? Another solution is that parents can educate themselves on mental illness and gain a perspective on it. They can do this by attending seminars and training workshops where they'll understand the difficult types of and causes of mental health problems among children. They also need to recognize that not every single child is going to be perfect. Mm. Wow, that's powerful. So parents should to learn about mental health stress. Okay, Ifoma. I would actually like to have some solutions for the African immigrant youth. Mm. I would say that you should remember that you only have one life and that life is yours to live. And doing so, isn't selfish as much at it, as much as it may seem when so much up so far has been like decided for you. Because if you don't live your life for yourself, you're gonna feel like something's missing. You're not gonna feel fulfilled if you're living through if you're living for your parents, basically. And I would also say that you should build a community of people who are going through what you're going through, because if you don't build that community or you don't see yourself reflected in others, then you might feel like you are alone in what you're going through. And that might make it very difficult. And if you also find a mentor who has not only gone through what you've gone through, but has in a way find, found a path out of outside of that, that also gives you hope to make sure that don't lose that faith that that's this like living for your parents like the only thing you can do that you can live your own life and be happy with that thank you very much well you all we really appreciate your time and your insights very priceless please can you all join me in appreciating this panel set of students for their time and effort and I'm just going to summarize um, quickly. I don't know that I have a lot of time, but I will go ahead and summarize our session. And then if we have time for questions, we'll take some of the questions that have been uh, coming in. I am also going to go ahead and share my screen because I just want to be able to uh, communicate effectively on this, um, on this topic. So basically what we have just heard um, is it, there's a lot to process, right? There's a lot to process. There's a lot to, um, to, to, to consider. And I basically want to tag this short message. What are your children becoming? It's a charge. I mean, you heard their stories. You know, in, in, in an African in our immigrant community, we have this thing of, oh, she's going to be a doctor. She's preparing to be a, a lawyer. You know, that's the goal. And nobody is fighting that that's, that's a good goal. But do you know that in addition to becoming that lawyer, in addition to their preparation to becoming a, a, a doctor, a nurse, or whatever, they are also becoming something else? They are also becoming something else. And in this situation, the question is, what is it they are becoming? What are they becoming? 
um, we just heard clearly about the different effects of uh, sources of mental health stress among our children. I have just concluded data collection where I have interviewed over 50 students, African immigrant students at Mercer University. And these are some of the findings that I have recorded in, in, uh, in, the, in the study that was conducted. This is just a summary, just a small summary. And what we are finding is that these sources of mental stress have immense impact on the lives of these young people. In fact, a lot of them, while they were talking to me, you can tell they never discussed their, their mental stress with anybody. Some attempts to discuss with their parents fell through the cracks. And you look at this story, you know, from sadness to anxiety, to bitterness, to resentment, to guilt, all this emotional uh, buildup of negative uh, uh, effect. And then you look at the, the, the mental health issues that it brings, this depression, this despair. I mean, a number of them told me I'm seeing a therapist, but my parents don't even know that I have a therapist. A lot of them struggle with suicidal thoughts the sense of hopelessness, low self-esteem. This whole idea of losing of personal identity is a big deal. But our parents in African setting, we don't even have a language for it. And then look at the social consequence, you know, the isolation, including drugs. Some of you may know your children are on drugs. You may not know. I know almost every session I had, there was somebody on some kind of drugs. <laughs> you will never tell, right? And they go with you to church. They probably come with you to ACF, but you never know that they're coping with some kind of substance, right? Dropping out of school, running away from home, lying to parents, loss of connection to parents. They have difficulty making friends because they see everybody as a competitor. They have problems trusting people. They, they just have that you know, a, a lack of validation. And in general, we call it a failure to launch. And yet these are high GPA students probably at the top of their class, but in the process of becoming a, a, a professional, they're also becoming something else. What are your children becoming? Character-wise, the issues of pride, a lot of them become so introverted. Some of them are prone to violence and even perfectionism. And you know, perfectionism is not really a good thing in settings, especially if it is inspired by, by a root factor that is negative. And look at the, the physical effects. I mean, somebody lost his brother because of pressure, you know? So those physical manifestation of migraines, insomnia, eating disorders, a poor immune system, all of those things, and even the risk of developing a mental illness from the stress becomes a case. So this thing is really heartbreaking when you, when you look at it because our children are dealing with a lot. And to be honest with you, a lot of them have not have not had opportunity to get these things resolved. The questions I want to leave you all with today is, what mental health struggles do my kids experience? Something that we didn't even touch on here is that their mental stress starts in elementary school. So here we're just having college students, but if you drill down to their stories, you find that the pressure the parents started creating was in elementary school when a father would tell a child, you know, a, a five-year-old child, uh, you know, basically, um, sorry, uh, tell a five-year-old child that if you have an A, you're my friend. If you have a B, you're not my friend. And what message do you send a little child who is struggling with racism, struggling with all sorts of things, discrimination, and you don't even know how they ended up with that B or that 97? And the child has to hear, you're not daddy's friend if you don't have an A. Without daddy acknowledging the difficulty in getting the A. And there's nothing wrong with wanting your child to get an A. It's just how, how that leaves the child, what, what it leaves the child with is what we're dealing with now. What are they becoming as a result of their struggles? To what extent are their struggles related to my actions? These are questions I want you to consider. How does my own mental health stress and challenges affect my children's mental health? You know, time will not permit me to talk about the mental health stress of adults. Things that we have chosen not to address. All of us carry mental stress. Once you've migrated here from Africa, you have stress to deal with. A lot of these stresses have escalated to the point where we need therapy, but nobody talks about getting therapy. 
In fact, praying about it even, we don't. We pray about things, we pray about systems, we pray about open doors, but we don't pray about our mental health. And then we download it on our children. What type of foundation am I laying for my children emotionally and mentally, right? And then of course this question is, how are you helping your children cope with or heal from mental and emotional trauma and injury from mental stress? This is loaded. Coping is one, healing is another, mental is one, emotional trauma is another. People have already sustained injury. So it's one thing to have trauma, it's another thing to have injury. These kids have all of them, right? How are we helping? And the final question here is, how can I partner with God and the Holy Spirit in helping my children receive deliverance? And when I say deliverance, I mean deliverance because you find that what is happening here is that a faulty foundation is being laid for these children. You think that, oh, I'm giving my children the best. I brought them to America, send them to the best schools. And we forget, even the Bible says that when at night time, after the, the, the seeds were sown, the enemy came and sowed tars, came and sowed weeds. What type of weeds? Are being sowed in your children, even attending the best schools and getting the best education. Those foundations or those things that are being sown into their lives are forming a foundation that to an extent becomes an open door for the enemy to, 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 to attack them and to enslave them in the future. So a child who develops unforgiveness and resentment from their parents due to the, the emotional stress they've gone through, the fact that their parents don't understand them, there's no open dialogue, there's no open communication. And the child may be sitting in your house smiling and saying, yes, dad, yes, mom, but deep inside that child's heart, there is unforgiveness, there is there's resentment. How do you think, you think that the enemy will not use that against the child, you know, spiritual warfare? Do you think that the child is gonna be free from all that? There's a lot of junk that is being deposited in our children's lives. And I'm just going to leave you with a few Bible verses. Psalm 11 verse 3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's no hope if there's no foundation. And right now, the foundations of our children are compromised because in addition to what they are going through, we are not necessarily praying for them and, and, and seeking that deliverance. We also don't want to forget that the Bible connects what children go through to their fathers and their parents. He says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admission of the Lord. We use this verse as a weapon, right? Sometimes. But look at verse Colossians 3.21. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. What does discouragement have to do with mental and emotional well-being? And if the Bible is telling you don't do it, that means that this is a foundation that other things can be built on. So the discouragement of your children is a spiritual warfare issue. And nobody is saying that children should not be spanked or corrected, but really we are talking about much more than that, right? So finally, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Do you have children who are already dealing with this crisis? How do you pray for them? Where do we go from here? Are you a young person going through this kind of crisis? What does the Lord say? I love this Isaiah 54 uh, verse. It's so powerful. I'm just going to read it out loud, and, and that's the last Bible verse I have to share. It says, Oh, a few afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear from, ter from terror, for it will not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Bible says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, shall come, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 Wow, that was a powerful introduction. I'm sure we would have um, had another more time to discuss about it. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
thank you um, to the students. We appreciate you coming on here to talk to us. This is, um, it's been a blessing and we are so glad that you actually make, made time to come, come spend it with us. We are grateful. Absolutely. So due to our time, unfortunately, we will not be able to take more, most of the questions on the chat, but I'd like to take one or two questions um, before we uh, move on. There's a question here, Dr. It says, do you think that many of the African parents are deliberately controlling their children or they fear their children may not succeed if they don't intervene in, in their children's lives? Um, there's two parts to that question. Yes, um, do I think that African parents are deliberately controlling their children? Um, yes, not all African parents, but yes, a lot of parents are deliberately controlling their children. And the second part of that question is because they are afraid that if they don't control their children, they are not going to become what they want. Uh-huh, yes. But the thing is, these same parents are well-intentioned. The goal of having a child that succeeds is well-intentioned. The point is the process, right? How do we get from where we are to where we need to go? And I will just say that one of the biggest challenges we, uh, we have is not, act, not co-parenting with the Holy Spirit, not co-parenting with the Lord, but taking it solely and saying, this is my child. I have the power over this child and I have to do that. And when the child is telling you that I, I, I'm different, you know, let's think differently. It becomes a big issue, okay? So the answer is yes, but it can be done differently. Well, thank you for that. Uh, one more question here. It says, please, my question is for the parents, more especially for our men. Is there any reason why they don't want to go to a Christian therapy for help in their marriage, mental health, or raising children in America? Ah, yes. We should ask them every day, there are 232 here. We can ask them and find out what's going on. We don't have time. I think people are so scared. So let's be quick. People are so scared of the whole term, terminology of mental health. You know, from back home, whenever you say anything mental, everybody starts running away. They think it's illness. There's a difference between mental well being, mental illness, mental problem, mental disorder, right? So when we talk about mental illness, we're not really saying somebody has bipolar or schizophrenia or psychosis. We're just saying that there's an imbalance, there's a state of mind that is just you know, gone beyond the emotional state that needs attention. A lot of parents are African immigrants. Like I said, everybody has a mental health situation. Think about the way you came to America. Think about your immigration experience. Think about just coping and survival, you know, making money and sustaining a family. There's stress there. So I would say why they don't want to go is first of all, they're scared. They're scared of the whole idea that when I have mental health, that means I have demons in you. That's a lie. But guess what? When you have mental stress and you do not deal with it, then that's when the demons are gonna come and want to stay. So when you recognize that something is not right, please go to a therapist. There are Christian therapists like the person pointed out. I'm not saying necessarily the pastor. Pastor may help you, you know, relatives may help you. But remember that the therapist is there as a professional to, to help you unpack the root cause of that state. You know, don't excuse it away. Don't say, oh, I'll just take a walk, I'll sleep, and I'll feel better. No. No, 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 no. There are steps that need to be taken. But most importantly, pray. A lot of times, mental health issues are, are spiritual warfare issues. And I'm not saying like parents will say, oh, it's a mental health. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, why don't we engage the Holy Spirit in why we are depressed? Why don't we engage the Holy Spirit in why we are anxious, why we are fearful, why we are controlling, right? Those things, what are the issues of unforgiveness in our lives? Because all forgiveness can give birth to children in our lives. And then we have bigger issues. So it's not that I'm saying that mental health issues have to only be prayed about. But I'm saying get a therapist. <laughs> Recognize, first of all, that there is a, a mental health situation. Get a therapist and engage, partner with the Holy Spirit in unpacking the sources of that mental stress in your life. Make it a project, right? Make it a prayer point and don't be ashamed of it, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chichi. That was very, 
power packed, you know, a lot to process in this section. And we really want to thank you once again. Um, everything that you guys have shared here, um, as I can just being a father, reflect and relate to so many of those things that you've mentioned. I remember uh, just moving here in the United States and having children here. My first son, I mean, I had to have this conversation with him to apologize some of the things because I saw the way I, that was all I knew, you know, just trying to um, enforce, you know, saying that this is principle and you have to listen and do what I mean, this boy was just about two years old. And when we had the second, our second son, I just saw myself, in fact, one day, a two years old young child running into my wardrobe to go get belt since we don't sell koboko or uh, you know i was running to my wardrobe to go uh, to get a, a nice belt to lash it on him because that's that's just part of the discipline that measures of discipline that i and the holy spirit intercepted me and um, say ask me a question where are you are you at home at that time, I was, I would leave the house in the morning and not have time to come back. And that kind of really, really, really contributed to a lot that the child was becoming. So I can really, really relate to, you know, many things that you have said. I just want to say, God bless you. This is a very healthy conversation that we need to start having. If it means, you know, our parents, you know, having to apologize, you know, because that's something that is difficult for you know, adults. And when I consider and relating this topic with legacy that we had, we, we are trying to, you know, cover up. Moses at a time needed to run into a mentor, even though this man was a hidden. I mean, he was able to, his father-in-law was able to say, hey, man, if you continue this way, my daughter will become a widow. You need to, you know, I mean, sometimes it's just about balance and all of that. So I really, really want to appreciate you for speaking life and, you know, inspiration into our hearts. God bless you and God bless you all. We'll go over to our next section at this time. And also, we wanted to apologize for the questions that we were not able to get to. Um, Dr. Chichi, if you have some time, we would appreciate if you can go to the chat and maybe answer some of the questions. It would be so helpful. And some of the panelists, your students already started making some contributions. Yes, good. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to go to our next um, our next program on the list. And I will go ahead and share that program once more. So this program on the list is a panel discussion and we'll be talking about godly perspective to end of life decisions. And we do have um, three panelists that will be joining us on the team. We really do appreciate you all for staying up here and um, being part of our program. Uh, so let us go ahead and introduce our guest speakers. The first person on my, on my list is Dr. Severa Olatidaria. She belongs to the first generation of young adults of the ACF and its inception. She's a graduate of West Virginia University School of Medicine, and she's both certified in family medicine and obesity medicine. She's a lead physician with Casa Permanente in Atlanta. She has passion for mission trips. She has participated in various mission trips, including medical mission endeavors in Arms of Care International. She's married with two children. When she's not practicing medicine, she loves to read, garden, and travel. And the next um, on the panel is Dr. Joy Akanji, NDP. She's married to Elder Joseph Akanji. Both have been members of ACF for over 28 years, studying in New Orleans, LA, now in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, they have been married for 40 plus years and are blessed with three sons, two daughter-in-laws and two precious granddaughters. As an adult ACF member, Sister Joy has served in different capacity in the organization. She is a praise and worship leader in her ACF chapter. She and her husband were ACF South Region Marriage Enrichment 
coordinators. During her 10-year tenure, the ACM National Board sees she served as the Director of Administration and Management, Board Secretary, Board Treasurer, and as the first National Confer Conference Planning Chair. Her contributions to the organizations have and will continue to impact the organization for years to come. Professionally, Sister Joy, as a registered nurse, has a wealth of experience in several clinical settings. She is a doctorally prepared registered nurse and the recipient of many professional awards, including her induction into the Nursing Hall of Fame. Awesome. She is the recording artist of the African Gospel CD, Joyful Heart of Worship. Oh, who would like to listen to that? Sister Joy Passion for Christian Family led her and her husband to co-author a book of marriage, stepping into the dawn of a lifetime journey how we did it the book was dedicated to their first son and his wife on their wedding day in 2008 that's awesome our other person on the list of the panelists is dr joel okoli he's a professor of surgery division of surgical oncology at moore high school of medicine atlanta georgia where he has been since september of 1996 he graduated from Seattle University with Bachelor's of Science, Clinical Chemistry, and Bachelor's of Art Biology. He graduated at Yale Medical School with Doctor of Medicine and Master of Public Health. Thereafter, he trained in general surgery at, school, at State University of New York at Buffalo. He then did surgical oncology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, after which he took the faculty appointment at Moha School of medicine. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, Society of Surgi Surgical Oncology, a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. His wife of 31 years went to, the glo to glory May 2015. He's a father of four children and he's a deacon at Sunrise Baptist Church in Lawrenceville. So without further ado, let us welcome our panelists to help us discuss this topic. Um, of godly perspective to end of life decision. So we will go ahead and spotlight our panelists at this time. Where are they? Um, where can we find them? So we'll just go ahead and pin them. I'm not sure if you can pin yourself, that would be great. Yes, please. Um, and we'll try to do that. Why? Yeah, uh, please, uh, bro, uh, Brother Emmanuel, help us to just pin them and make them co-host so we can be able to add them. And the way this um, panel session will go is that we have some questions that we would be throwing out and also would like for the audience to participate as well mm -hmm. by typing in your comments or questions in the chat box. So we would um, take those questions as they come um, with our questions as well. So this is Dr. Joy Akanji. Thank you. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. <laughs> Good to be here. Thank you, Dr. Severo Olatide. Thank you, Dr. Joel Okoli. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So like my wife already said, the way we'll go will be to just, um, you know, give them an open question. They will just, you know, answer and then shipping their own experience with regards to some of the things that uh, we'll be asking them. So, honey. All right. So when we talk about godly perspective to end of life decision, you know, the truth is that no one can really prepare for that. Enough. It's a one time event. It's yeah. not something that happens and then you come back. Um, to redo it. It's not like going to work and coming back. Let's say about 100 years ago, um, okay, good. About 100 years ago, most people spent their last days at home, and that was normal. But today, about 20% of people die at home. So most people are either in hospice and or in ICU. And if you are not a medical expert, there are so many options and information that are thrown at you and the equipments that are being used these days, such as ventilators, um, feeding tube dialysis. And um, I know with COVID, um, we've actually had a chance to um, get in contact with some of those equipment that we probably wouldn't even have to if there wasn't COVID, you know. Um, I, I don't know if many of you know my mom um, 
passed away last year. This will be her one year anniversary. And that was when we realized when she was in ICU, there were so many decisions that needed to be made. We were not prepared for it. So the question we want to throw at you today is how can we prepare our loved ones? Uh, how can we prepare ourselves to move to the end, uh, to the next level? Absolutely. So I just want to, um, first of all, give this question to uh, Dr. Tolson, please. Uh, take the question, how can we prepare when it comes to uh, end of life decisions? Uh, do we do it when we are taken to the hospital, perhaps when things are going the wrong way? Or is it something that we can start quite on time to begin to when we are still very healthy and alive? I know this is a topic that uh, most Africans, uh, you know, we dread, you know, kind of scare away and not <laughs> want to have this conversation. So I'm glad today that we're able to just begin to have these conversations. Thank you very much. And Chichi, my condolences again from the death of your mom. I know as Africans, we are very, we're a little funny about death. It's one of those things that, you know, we don't like to talk about and, you know, we generally pray against, but whether we like to talk about it or not, it's inevitable. It does happen. And um, it is very important for us to plan because, and unfortunately, as you know, I said earlier, that it is something that will happen to everyone. That's a guarantee. You know, in America, there's what they call advanced care planning. And this is something that as physicians, I'm gonna come from the medical point of view. I'm sure you know, um, some of the other panelists may talk about maybe the spiritual aspects of things. But from a medical point of view, there's what we call advanced care planning. And um, most physicians generally, uh, primary care physicians talk about this with uh, patients, especially those over the age of 65. And advanced care planning, even though we you know, talk about it with elderly people, it's really for everybody. Everyone should really oh, have an advanced me. care plan. Um, a medical crisis could happen to anyone at any time. And um, it, when it happens, you want to make sure that, you know, it's something that you have thought about and you know what steps to take. Because sometimes in the middle of the crisis, that's a very difficult time to make decisions. And if you've ever been in a crisis, sometimes you're just overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. There is what is called an, a living will. And this is a document, it's a legal document that you can actually put together before a crisis. And basically it just outlines the decisions that you want to, that you want for yourself. Many times, we um, think about, you know, what we, I mean, we don't even think about what we want, but it's good to set some time to think about it. And in case something happens, do you want people to fully resuscitate you? Do you want to do everything possible? Or do you want natural death to just occur? You can speak with your doctor. There's actually a legal document that you can actually, um, you can download it on the internet or you can get a copy from your doctor's office. Also, many times when you're admitted to the hospital, they also give you an advance directive. It's a very good mm -hmm. idea to go through it because it goes through different scenarios and what you would want. The other part of that is also to have a power of attorney. That is you have somebody, if you're unable to speak on your behalf, you want someone to be able to speak for you. So that's somebody designated to speak for you. Usually, this also, as we advance in age, it's good to talk to your children, you know, about situations like this. For example, who in the family do you think will know what you want and who can speak for you? And then for all of us, we need to think about what we would want. For example, how aggressive do we want to be? If the doctors say, whatever is going on with you medically is futile. Do you want them to keep trying? Or do you want death to just occur? What most people are very um, scared about is suffering towards the end of life. And there's what they call comfort care. So the fact that they don't put a tube down your throat to make you breathe doesn't mean they're just going to leave you alone. They can make you very comfortable. 
So it's good to kind of walk through all the different scenarios. And I know for the space of time, you know, I, I won't go through all of that, but there's information out there. You can download information and it will take you through all the different scenarios and what you want to have done if that happens. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you for throwing a lot of light on that question. Uh, the next question will go to you, Dr. Joel Coley. Uh, in the African uh, environment, we see most times when people die, we look at the family and we look at the deceased person as a victim. There's this psychology. I remember when my mother-in-law passed, you know, in the midst of the emotional stress that we're just dealing with, I remember in form of encouragement, somebody actually reached out and said to us, you know, you guys need deliverance. Uh, we need to call somebody. So how can we change our perspectives uh, being Africans? And that actually shows up in the way we pray. Most times when we pray, you see the type of prayer we pray and it's as if that we are just, you know, I mean, everybody, you know, one day will die, but it looks like um, we are just, we see most times people who are in this type of situation or families who are going through this situation as victims of death. Okay, uh, uh, thank you my brother Martin and my sister Shandy for the opportunity to participate in this uh, panel discussion. I just want to commend you for your tremendous effort in putting this together. Uh, I, I really deeply uh, uh, appreciate uh, the reflection, the commentary by my sister Tosin, which was really pretty comprehensive in discussing some of uh, what's available uh, to people. Yeah, who are going to end of life experience and how to get prepared for it. Uh, and I completely concur with her that uh, talking about death is a taboo. It's not something that we delight in talking about. Um, I can tell you I was married for 31 years um, with my wife and we did not at any point I don't know what, I'm, we did not at any point ever talk about death. That is the last thing that uh, we come into our mind. Can you just imagine one day, oh, let's talk about death, the possibility that I may die or my wife will die. My father died at uh, 97. You can't imagine your father dying. You can't imagine your mother dying. Uh, you, don't, you don't just talk about it. And the people's impression about death itself and sickness, uh, especially amongst Africans and especially uh, amongst some Christian organizations, I believe is flawed. Um, some believe that uh, if you're Christian, you should never have uh, any kind of illness, physical, emotional, otherwise. And they quote biblical scripture to support themselves that you are free from all the diseases that can afflict uh, the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So and um, by the stripes of uh, our Lord and our Savior on the cross, we have been healed completely and totally. So if you are sick and uh, members of the Christian organization pray for you for healing and you are not healed, it may mean that you lack faith or it may mean that there is some kind of a problem, spiritual problem that you have. And that is why yeah, God did not answer your prayer. And then they look at you as somewhat defective, that you have some kind of a, a problem. And you may hear Christians, when they come to prayer meetings, they talk about God as not answering prayer. So they do believe that the only way God answers prayer is yes, exactly what you're praying for. In other words, that God is like a genie. You command God, and some actually talk about it, that you go ahead and command God to do something for you. So God is there, you can turn him on and turn him off and tell him what to do. Whether it's your loved one that is sick, 
you pray for healing and God should heal her. If God doesn't heal her, you have a problem. And that is a problem that creates psychological problem amongst people. And then you, not only are you hurting emotionally from a loved one that passed, and I sympathize with you, Chandi. I mean, if I had not gone through what I went through, I probably would say I don't understand, but I did, I did. Uh, in 2014, my wife was as healthy as anybody. She wrote a book. She has a doctor of pharmacy degree. She wrote a book on dynamic health, dismantled obstacles, obstacles for people not living a good life, not living a healthy life. How people are so dependent on medications and all what not for any kind of a problem that they encounter. Little did we know that in less than a year, she would pass on. We didn't know that. We didn't imagine that. Even as a physician, I didn't see that coming. She was more physically active than me. She was, if you look at her, in supposedly perfect health. Ideal, ideal being one. And when we take a walk, she walks faster than me because she believed in physical exercise, eating the right type of food. There are some foods that are not, are not even, even ever mentioned or considered in my house. The way that she is concerned about uh, healthy eating and healthy lifestyle until illness struck and uh, a uh, type of disease process that none of us expected, a really strange type of uh, lymphoma that was very aggressive, uh, that during the last nine months of her life, every chemotherapy that was tried failed. She continued to just deteriorate. She spent more time in the hospital than at home. Between all, she had tremendous faith. She was a woman of faith. She believed that God would still heal her. Even when the doctors told her lesson that it looks like you've lost a battle to this malignancy. He said, well, you know, you are saying that. God didn't say that. That with my God, nothing is impossible. She was there ministering to the nurses, to the doctors in the hospital. And um, <clears throat> she said, it's not over until it is over. And so the question is, how do we handle it? And some of the issues that uh, Tosin already dis uh, discussed, we, again, we never talked about, you know, um, should she get intubated if she were to stop breathing? Uh, should she go through what we call DNR, do not resuscitate? Uh, we as, family members who want to be able to say that we've done everything possible yeah, to save her. You think maybe uh, this last intervention will be what will take care of that. So at one point when it is clear to me, even as a surgical oncologist, I recognize that unless God does a miracle that she wasn't going to recover from this. So further care is uh, basically an effort in fertility. And again, I said, God help my unbelief in this matter. So, but I still pushed on. You wouldn't believe that at Emory University Hospital, because I had privileges there, when her heart for a moment simply stopped beating, I ran the code because the doctors couldn't come. They couldn't come in time and I was by her bedside. I ran the code. And I ordered different medications to be used on her. And then she came back, but only for a few minutes. So I had a meeting with my children and said, I know your mom. Your mom is not the kind of a person who would like to have a tube in her throat and all kinds of tubes coming from different parts of the body and people coming to look at her and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, she didn't really want to tell anybody that she had cancer. She didn't want us to tell the people in the 
And the church, those that belong to her Sunday school uh, class, that she was going through this process. And so then the question is, what are we going to do? She also at the same time knew exactly who she is. She knew where she was going. And she knew that even though she loved her children and would give her life for her children, uh, yeah, that she loved them so much that because of her children, she would like to stay on her life. But she knew that heaven was better. Yeah, one of the scriptures that was a legacy that she left to all of us, even before we got married, she gave me that scripture. And I have valued that scripture till today. And that is Jeremiah 29, 11, that our heavenly father said, I know the plan that I have for you. And that plan is to give you peace and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. That's God. Another scripture that she gave us that meant so much to me was from Revelation 19, 6, where God said, <clears throat> Hallelujah, Lord God omnipotent reigneth, that God reigns, God reigns, <clears throat> and is in control of every circumstance that encouraged us. So bearing all this in mind, we said, you know, if God wants to do a miracle, God doesn't need a ventilator to do that miracle. Yeah, that if God is going to turn things around, God can. God raised up Lazarus when Lazarus was dead and stinking for four days. So we are not going to allow endotracheal intubation. Okay, we like the idea of what is called hospice. I know Justin didn't mention hospice, but it's some kind of comfort care, palliative care to make the patient more comfortable. The hospice can be at home or can be in the hospital, but she was still in the hospital. Yeah, so uh, we said, yes, she can go to hospice, comfort, care, and so on, palliation of discomfort. So that's what we agreed on. But we're all unanimous in this. My children and I said, this is what we agreed to do for my wife and their mother. She did not have a living will. I did not have a will yeah, because, I mean, if you start talking about death, people think that you have a premonition that you're going to die. Yeah, so we never talked about it. Yeah, so that's basically what we did. Ultimately, we look up to God Almighty uh, in every situation, not what people think, not what people say. We never consider ourselves as victims. And all you have to do is to look through scripture. Uh, all of the apostles, but one, all the apostles, but one, were martyred. And the one, John, who was not martyred, I'm excluding Judas in this, okay, lived to be in his 90s and ultimately died. Well, God could have prevented his apostles from being martyred. When Stephen was being stoned to death, God could have intervened and killed off all those people that were stoning him to death. So you're praying, look at John the Baptist. He was murdered by a wicked king, Herod, because he was speaking the truth. We, and Jesus told us, in this world, you will have tribulations, but cherub must have overcome the world. Amen. So, Amen. It, 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 yeah. So we, we have to trust God and depend on God that when God looks at things, he looks at a continuum, not just what happens during the short time we have on planet Earth, but what happens to forever. Everlasting healing is what is important. And that everlasting healing is our knowledge that ultimately we're going to spend eternity with God when there'll be no cancer, when there will be no disease process, when we are going to be perfect, seeing we have been uh, completely uh, destroyed, and then we be glorified. But so long as we are here on earth, we're going through progressive sanctification until we see Jesus face to face. And as the songwriter said, wow, I can only imagine what it's going to be like. Like Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So people look at death as something horrible. No, he said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord, that he would rather prefer to be with the Lord, which is infinitely better. And he said the sufferings of this world do not compare to the glory that God has for us. So, so let me tell you, my brethren and my sisters, we have to look at death in a different way. 
I'm not saying that we that are left behind don't hurt, but our loved one that has departed is no longer suffering. She's saved, and she is in the best place, or he's in the best place that he can possibly be. Hello, for some reason, I'm not hearing anything. Amen, amen. Yes. Martin, you are muted. Your sound, for some reason, your sound is out, yeah. Hmm. You hear us now? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Joel, for this wonderful testimony. And I also sympathize with your loss, um, praying that God will continue to restore healing to you and your family. Um, so we're going to go to the next question. This is for um, Dr. Joy Akanji. Um, the question is, what are some of the concerns you have seen people express for their loved ones or even the person receiving care, either spiritually or materially or otherwise? Thank you, uh, Chandy and, uh, and Martin. Just like the, uh, the first speakers have already uh, talked about, it's not always an easy thing to talk about, you know, death and dying. But one of those things that, uh, that we must face, like our, one of the speakers said earlier, we owe two things, death and taxes. So no matter what, it's one of those things that we certainly have to, to pay. Now, one of those things that people, you know, the kind of concern that they've had to uh, express is the fact that they were not prepared. They didn't know whatever was gonna happen. They didn't know their loved ones was gonna die. I mean, people come to the hospital, you know, they feel bad. And after they've been treated, they feel a little better. Some have even had lunch and all of a sudden in the evening, boom, you know, they're coding them. Wait a minute, we didn't know what happened and this and that. So that can actually be uh, a big issue for people. However, if they had been prepared before, it would help them a whole lot to be able to deal with that situation. So one of those things that is very important for us, you know, is to be able to prepare our family, just like, uh, you know, some of the speakers had said before, it will cut down the kind of guilt that they will have, having to be the one to, to say, okay, pull the plug or don't pull the plug, you know, what needs to be done, or uh, maybe let's just wait a little bit or, or, or whatever. It surely will take that guilt away from them, you know, if they have been fully prepared that, you know, just in case if I die, you know, uh, this and this and this is what I want to be done, you know, so that will surely help them a whole lot. I remember while we were living in New Orleans, you know, there, was this, uh, this, there was this elderly lady, and of course she knew that she was going to die some, someday, but she was fine, nothing was really wrong with her other than growing old. Well, guess what? She had her drawer already prepared. The underwear that she wants them to, to put her in when she dies, uh, the kind of clothes that she wants to, she wants them to dress her in. I mean, she had everything laid out so that when that time comes, and then she didn't even have any child at all. Even she willed her house and stuff like that, you know, to her friend's children, you know, because I mean, she had nobody else to give them to, but she had everything prepared and ready just in case and whenever. So that with that, even people that had no clue who she really was, when something happened, they knew this exactly whatever she wanted. We've also heard of people who have actually gone ahead and bought a piece of land and say, well, if I pass on, this is what I, you know, this is where I would like to be laid at. Now, why us at this time? Just like we've already heard, this is one of those things that we don't want to talk about. But I can tell you, many of us on this line right now are in our 50s. 60s, even 70s, sitting here today, okay? And there's some who are 40s and 30s and maybe below, but none of us is getting younger. And, you know, I'm a typical example of one of those people who didn't want to hear anything about death and dying. When my husband will tell me, like, uh-uh, no, that's not the topic I want to talk about, you know, so we won't even dare go there at all. I was so scared of dying. But I tell you what, six and a half years ago, when that experience hit me, <laughs> I knew what it is. 
for somebody to pass on from my family and never to return to this world. And that's our very firstborn son when God took him home. This was somebody who was not sick. Nothing was wrong with him. We only received that call that Father's Day morning of June 21, 2015, when the wife said, Don is sick, taking him to the hospital, um, you know, riding behind the ambulance. The wife was a physician also. So nobody envisaged anything. And this was five weeks shy of his 33rd birthday. So you can just imagine he was full of life, and, but he loved the Lord so much. So God took him even at an early age. You know, five years before then, ACF National had fasted and prayed and, you know, at the local level, at the regional level, everybody was really praying because some deaths were going on. Some young adults were being taken. And I'm like, Lord, what is going on? We fasted, we prayed. I, I was even the one that, uh, you know, that, that talked to the board members because I was on the board at that time. I was, I was under actually spearheaded it. And interestingly, exactly five years after that, my son was laid down for people to, to view. So what am I saying? You, you just don't know, nobody knows. But it's very important for us to be prepared. And I can tell you that after that day, I'm no longer afraid of death or dying because why? this is my son that's laid down here. I can talk about it freely. We miss it, but I can talk about it because it doesn't face me anymore because I know where he's at. This is somebody that loved the Lord so much. I mean, even in his diary, everything is King Jesus reigns, King Jesus reigns. So that has become our own mantra, King Jesus reigns. At, as early as he was, you know, in this life, God took him that early. And there were so many in this ACF group that their children at 14, at say, you know, 12, that God had taken home. So what am I saying? We have an assignment. God has assigned us certain particular time in this day and age. None of us knows because three days after the Lord took him, my husband had a vision of our son up there. And it's like, Don, come down here. You can go. He said, daddy, I have completed my assignment. Daddy said, no, I should be the one who said, no, daddy, you can't come yet because you have not completed your assignment. Until you do, you cannot come. But for me, I have finished and I'm going back to God. Now, what greater assurance does anyone need to have besides that? And the comfort of the Holy Spirit has always been there with us. That's why you see us today, you never know that one of our children is no longer here. And I don't use death for him because I know he's alive where he's at. It takes the grace of God, but we have to be prepared. Let's stop deceiving ourselves, brethren. Even in those days, I remember um, in the scripture, Isaac prayed over his children, Jacob pray, prayed over his, you know, his children because they knew that the time was, was getting close, isn't it? Even Joseph told them whatever he wanted for them to do with his uh, you know, bones you know, when they left, because he knew that God was gonna take them out of slavery. We need to be prepared. And I didn't tell you my story to make you feel bad for me or whatever. I'm fine. We're okay. We are, you know, we give God the glory for our lives, for how we raise them in the fear and in the nurture of the Holy Spirit. And so just like a brother Joel said, you know, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Because that same day we knew he's gone. He is gone to the Lord. That reminded me of that thief that was right there on the cross. And Jesus told him, tonight you will be with me in paradise. So the same time that they stop breathing here, they ride up there with the Lord, the King of glory, rejoicing with the angels and shouting hallelujah glory. So brethren, it doesn't matter how old we get or how young we are. Let it continue to be on the back of our mind. We never know. We just don't know. Some people is by accident, not because they asked for it, but that's what happened. Some of our brethren, the children having, start having some real nasty headache, got to the hospital, and that was the end of it. Young people, but by the time you hear about the story of these children, you know, oh, we raised an angel, we didn't even know it. There was something peculiar about them, how much they loved the Lord and stuff. So we just never know, but God is faithful to his word. 
There are some sicknesses he will heal. There are some that he wouldn't because he is sovereign. He knows the time that he has already planned for each and every one of us. Some of us can live, you know, up to 90, 100 years old. So, you know, things are out there to help people. But let us be prepared and let us prepare our people. A few minutes ago, me and my husband were talking and then he mentioned my dad. My dad passed on at the age of 92. But a few years back when uh, my husband had gone home and daddy took my husband to his farm and he was saying, you know, those of you who are abroad, you can have this land, you know, this is for you. But I kid you not, just about a couple of years ago, you know, my, my siblings, they sold that land and distributed the money to all of us. <laughs> what am I saying? Daddy never told them that he gave this land to those who are in America. <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> So the story needs to be the same. If you're telling your child, just tell the other child the same story so that when that time comes, they're all aware of it. It's not like maybe you tell this one one story, the other one doesn't know, the other one, and then they're going to be fighting here and there because of something. So I'm not going to belabor the point. Let's be prepared and let's prepare our children. You just never do. The Lord might just come today. And if it comes, we should be ready to go with it. God bless you. Thank you so much. That was packed, you know, also with your testimony. And I believe, you know, just you speaking today, uh, this has become a testimony, even though people might still, there are people who the same thing will happen to, it become one of the worst tragedy. But, you know, God has given you uh, a testimony to be an encouragement to some other person who may have experienced the same thing. So this is what we're gonna do because of our time, we'll try to start rounding up. Uh, this is a very vast topic. So what I would do, you know, the next question, I'm going to be um, giving this question to Dr. Tosin and we'll go around again just to get a final thought. And I would like uh, Elder Joseph to actually make a comment when it comes to your own turn, uh, Mommy Joy. That would just be like a closing statement. But this question, you know, uh, Dr. Tosin will be for you and the closing statement. At what point as believers do we stop, you know, the aggressive uh, treatment? Um, just understanding the impact and the trauma that the person who is receiving the care is going through. At what point? Maybe based on because the person did not say anything. Take, for instance, my mother-in-law. You know, I was, you know, uh, they asked me to say things because, you know, I was more like, you know, a son who who's supposed to. And I am not well educated in, you know, enough to know or informed enough to know exactly what to do. I had to, you know, depend on some uncles and reaching out. You know, at a point we just kept believing, let's do what we're supposed to do. Let's keep, you know, fighting until the last point. We're gonna pull everything available. I know that medicine has made a remarkable gains and when it comes to skill, you know, all of you, you have really been disciplined to in your you know, field of expertise. So at what point uh, we believe us need to stop pragmatism because miracle is simply God intervening without help of man. So at what point can we, so this will be also like your closing statement and let's make it brief. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I believe um, Dr. Okoli really actually talked about this when he was giving his testimony about his wife. And, um, there are usually two different scenarios. When a younger person um, gets critically ill, somebody who we don't expect you know, to get ill or who was previously healthy, you know, we are all, I mean, most of the time, everybody wants to do all they can. That's a very no, uh, natural thing. Even physicians, you know, you want to try every single thing possible to keep this person alive, especially because they're young, they have, you know, future ahead of them. And so even as uh, Dr. Coley said with his wife that, you know, um, you know to, even almost towards the end, you know, he, he himself ran a code, you know, um, trying the best he could to resuscitate her. Um, so, but what time do we call it quits? And 
he said that many times for lay people, the doctors can let you know when that time is. You know, when you've tried everything possible, they've done um, chest compressions, they've done so many things, they've given all kinds of medication and this, uh, your loved one cannot really sustain life on their own. Many times it comes to a point where they ask, now, should we help this person breathe? Should we put a tube down to help this person breathe? And should we put this person on a ventilator? Doctors many times will tell you when it's possible that this is just going to be temporary. But if they say there's no way, other way this person will sustain life, then that certainly could be a time to say, okay, we've done all we can. And again, we're still, it doesn't mean you're not trusting God because God raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, he was dead for four days and God raised him up from the dead. So God can do anything, but it's time to let medicine sit and let your loved one very peacefully pass away. Now, when somebody is old, let's say they're in their eighties or their nineties, you don't even have to have them go through all of that. Um, many times, the, you know, uh, if they are really towards the end of life, be it from cancer or a sudden crisis, there's what we call hospice care or comfort care. And they can make the loved one very comfortable and let them pass away very, you know, peaceably. So I think that listening to the physicians and when they tell you that really there's nothing that can be done um, naturally, to help this person. And what they are going to be doing is more artificial, you know, putting the person on a ventilator or helping the person breathe. That's a time to um, let people go. You know, in conclusion, you know, I talked about, you know, a living will advance directives for healthcare. What I see in my practice is that a lot of Americans and especially white Americans plan for everything and they plan for their end of life. They usually, Many times we offer people this um, information that this is a living will, you know, sit down with your family, talk about what you want to do, what you want will happen, you know, what you want to happen for you if something like this should happen. And you think about the different scenarios. I see that a lot of the uh, Americans, they take the documents home, they read through it and they bring it back, they sign it. So they think about the end of life. But we tend not to want to do that. But it really makes the transition so much easier because when you when they go to the hospital and something bad happens, everybody knows what needs to go on. Everybody knows, you know, what steps to take. And it's not so chaotic because when you don't decide before, you have to make decisions in the moment. And there's just so much emotional energy going on there. It's so hard. But once, you know, you know, in fact, just having somebody to speak for the family it makes a big difference because then they are not, people are not fighting. Sometimes at the bedside, you have children who, who don't want to agree or children who have never, who haven't spoken to the parents in 20 years. They come in and they say, do everything for mom. And then the ones who've been taking care of them say, no, you know, let her go peaceably. And then there's, you know, there's not agreement and there's so much discord. But once you have this document signed and you actually are you doing it for your family because when you're going through a crisis, you yourself, you're not really involved. It's really the family that's making all these decisions. So that's one of the things we can do for our family members to make their transitions you know, smooth, to make our transition smooth. Same thing as you know, having a will. When you have a will, then everybody knows what your wishes are. The same mm -hmm. thing for end of life in, regarding your health. It's like having a will for your health. So I really, recommend it. We don't want to think about it, but it's something that we need to think about. And, you know, you can either work with your lawyer in part of when you make your will, your living will, advance directives is actually part of your will. So you can talk about it. And I thank God for this forum because everybody's hearing about it. So at least, you know, you can talk about it formally or informally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very helpful information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mommy Joy Akanji, I will get back to you right now. And this would just be like a closing statement, you know, in general, what you want our brethren to just begin to think about. And I would like if Elder can just, um, you know, chip in here in a few words, you know, when we talk about will, 
I know uh, Dr. Tosin has also mentioned that you can get some of these things like uh, at the hospital, you know, by your doctor. And how do we simplify this issue of will? Because most times people think that a will has to be, you know, with a lawyer and stamped, you know, it, like is a, a sophisticated process and that kind of makes it, how do we approach it from just a common layman idea? Uh, I want Elder Joseph to chip in on that. Mommy Joy, this is over to you just, you know, in summary, because we are battling with time right now. Yes, again, you know, let's prepare ourselves. Unfortunately, nobody is too young to die. And nobody is too old to die. When that time comes, it's important that our people, our children, our family have a peace of mind to know that we have prepared them for such a time. And so with that, the guilt and all of that will be seriously minimized because everybody will pretty much be on the same page and we'll be glad that we have done our best. So I'll turn it over to the love of my life of 40 something years. Hey, honey. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm not going to repeat what everybody has said. The panelists, treated it really good. I'm just going to lay emphasis on what is important for us. When you talk about planning, in uh, accounting terminology, we call it estate planning. Plan your estate. Whether it is a house that you built, or a vehicle you want to pass down, or big fat money you have in the bank. If you don't plan it, just like uh, Dr. Tose said, it, it will create problem for those that you are leaving behind. Now, when should you do this? The answer is now, now that you have a chance. Many of us may not have a chance, e.g. if accident happens and so on and so forth, fire and so, so, so many things can deprive you of the chance. Should it be that complicated out of all the three things that uh, Dr. Tosin mentioned earlier? like the um, will, the advanced medical plan, and the power of attorney? No. The answer is no. You can do it right now. Once we finish, jokingly, with peace of mind, address it with one another, And the name of the Lord will be glorified. Some things that are very simple. Some will, and then this depends on your state. You know, like uh, when we were in Louisiana, the, you can write your will. Take a piece of paper and put everything in writing, but it has to be handwritten and some other terms. Now, I don't want to go into details into all of this because it's going to take too much of our time. That is why we need education, education, education on all of this. And by God's grace, if we plan right, if we take advantage of the opportunity we have now, if we got the necessary education that is needed at the appropriate time, God will help us and everything will be okay with us. If you want, there are so many of us, the brother that made presentation on budgeting, uh, many accountants among us, many lawyers among us, you can consult any one of us. And of course, we got some other stuff that 
it will take a an eight hour course to go over everything in details and we are running out of time so please get the needed education as soon as possible thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you elder for uh, being willing to chip in and just simplifying this process dr joel i just want to you know give you the, you know one minute i don't mean to you know let you down just you know your final um, thoughts statement please just we are already four o'clock just um yeah thank you well just want to let you know that um, shortly after we have celebrated the life of my wife, I went and met a lawyer <laughs> because when my wife was alive, I said, if anything happens to me, she would take care of the situation. And if something happened to her, I would take care of the situation. So I immediately went to see a lawyer and they wrote up a will. And then that will included what will happen to me when I not mentally make a decision uh, and uh, who will take that responsibility. I went to the extent of telling everybody, including my way, where I want to be married. And I, next to my wife, and I purchased a burial place, uh, prepared for it, for me, and told them, don't worry about sending me to Nigeria. What? I have lived my life here in the United States, served in the United States, served God's people in the United States. You bury me next to my wife. If something were to happen to me, my children don't have to worry about that. So, so basically, what you don't want to talk about, yeah, I said, now we have to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel. That was very helpful. Thank you. I know that uh, one, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Brother Isaiah wants to make a comment. Uh, before that, I just want to share this scripture with us. Uh, that will be Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and verse 39. It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's law. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Um, we will conclude this section uh, with this. And, and I just want to thank our panelists. I know this is something that we would have loved to give you more opportunity to continue to share. And we have even like more questions uh, coming from the audience. And please audience, if you have any question, uh, go ahead and you know, type it in. Um, our panelists will just continue to try and see if they can make any um, contribution there. Okay. Thank you. We are going to the next section. Uh, we want to apologize for the time. You know, this is a lot, you know, that we're trying to just be able to, you know, condense in one section. Uh, let us just go to this next section. We don't want to leave us in a very, um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, with emotions and things running. By the grace of God, we have our, our predecessor, uh, Dr. Koro and Sister Suzanne coming on board to just um, ginger us up and to know that we can still make a good uh, use of our time while we're here and enjoy each other with regards to communication. So, but before that, we have just this uh, video that we wanted to share with us. We know that this is a family enrichment program. At the same time, we understand there are couples. Um, in fact, I've seen there are young couples who are here who are still trying to figure out how to navigate you know, their, their, their challenges in their marriage. So we just want to play this video 
and stay tuned. And um, after that, Dr. Okoro and Sister Susan will be helping us to wrap up this event. <music>
because that person is the center of your heart and you, you love that, you love your spouse so much, but they can't be the person who is your source of every happiness and you, you are my sense of identity and my sense of joy and everything. You, you have joyful, you're one in marriage, but only God is the one that um, will never disappoint you. That's true. And I, th I think for me, it's a lot more basic in terms of why I argue, why I fight, why I get into all of these things. I, I think that it comes down to just the, the, the basic selfishness that I know is, is inside of my heart. I was thinking about this. I want to uh, look right here. And uh, God's word just, just hits it right on the head with uh, the, the source of our arguing and our fighting. So here, uh, God says in his word in the book of James, what causes fights and quarrels among you? That's what we're asking right now. Why do we fight? Kids and chihuahuas. Kids and chihuahuas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a little more profound. Okay. Uh, don't, they, uh, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, you want things, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and so you fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So, I, I mean, I look at that and I say, I mean, you're everything I've always hoped for in a wife and in a mom for my kids. I, that's not a source of my arguing. My arguing comes from, there are things that I want. I want my work to be a certain way. I want the kids to be a certain way. I want circumstances, I guess, to line up the way that I think will work out best for our family and for our future. And when, they, when I can't control that, my pride, my selfishness rises up and that makes me irritable. And, I, I, and that's, that to me right. is where I need to go. And, and I see that I don't have what I want because I'm not asking God. And if I am asking God with a selfish heart, I'm asking with the wrong right. motive and it's still all about me. And so right. that means I got to think differently if I need, if I'm going to get out of this arguing and quarreling mm -hmm. kind of mode. And I feel like you, you said something really, I think really important is just, you can't control it. And I think that's what a big deal is that we want to control another person to be everything we want them to be. Yeah. And I don't think we, I don't think we were made to control or change anyone. I think God, God changes people. And I hope that I'm a vessel of change because we all need to grow. We all need to change and that you, you would help me to become all I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but we do try to control people and change them. And I just never goes well. It just never goes well. And it usually leaves you feeling very unhappy. And yes, it is. It is a selfish quality. Everything is supposed to be serving me the way that I want, you know, and that was never. Or I have the best plan so that our house and our family runs the right way for the best result right. and people are not getting on board my program or right. the dogs are barking and, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, the promotion didn't come through with the job and my plans are not working right. out. And it's like, really what it is, is I'm kind of wanting to play. Uh, I want to be the master controller of my universe, right. but I'm not God. And, and so that's where the frustration comes in. And that's where I have to learn to no, you're not, submit huh? my, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if you look in the Bible as, and you start reading, wherever God talks about like marriage, kids, husbands, wives, the focus is so different than really what we focus on. It's always on serving well, submitting, honoring, you know, so that the glory of God can be seen through your marriage. It's kids, that obedience, that teach them well and, you know, raise them up to, in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's like, if you look at God's instruction, if you just go there, it's very different on the things that we focus on. Hmm. There's this big, we focus on, are you making me happy? And are you doing everything that I think you should be doing? And, you know, are you supplying my needs kind of it just becomes it's if there's a, a real and I didn't know that when I first got married I I don't think I really knew the instruction that God gives about marriage we've learned a lot in 27 years yeah still learning a still lot <laughs>
over here. We just have to put our video back on. Okay, so this. Go ahead, baby. So this video was just a prelude to our next session on how to communicate effectively with your family or in your marriage and um, also maintaining or setting healthy boundaries. So we're going to bring our uncle and auntie. They are the ones that introduced us and passed this baton to us to um, be coordinators. So they did this for so many, many, many years. So uh, we are so honored and delighted to have them to be the ones addressing this topic today. And uh, we know that you're going to be blessed. So Dr. Bioha and Reverend Susan Okoro have been married for 28 years and we are and their proud parents to three wonderful children, Grace, Marge, and Ben, and one grandson, little prophet Elijah. Obioha is from Nigeria and Susan is originally from Kenya and they met at ACF National Conference. Dr. Kaur is a pediatrician and, and Susan is his practice manager. They are members of Stone Age Church here um, in Macon. And they are the founders of ACF Macon and Susan is the current president. They are the immediate past ACF South Region Marriage Family Enrichment Coordinators. So without wasting our time, let us um, welcome Dr. Obioha and Reverend Susan Okoro. Um, I just want to thank the Lord. Did you? Yeah. I think we're still. We're still. No. no. Okay. Can you hear? Us? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Praise the yes, Lord. Uh, we we thank the Lord so much. This has been impactful. This has been awesome, and um, I can tell you that I've not been bored even for one second. Uh, that is how good this has been. And so I just thank the Lord for what the Lord is doing and what the Lord will continue to do in this fellowship. Um, before I continue, I just want to thank um, the executive, Brother Emmanuel Onaleru and his team for a wonderful job that they are doing. And I want to commend our young daughter and son um, for putting this together. This has been awesome. 